Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my stream tonight. I'm glad you can join me. I'm going to be talking about some new stuff going on with Solid. Um, seems like chat's already been going on before I even got here. Um, just going to catch up a minute. Wow, there's, an, there's a bunch of people here already. Ryan likes anime because it's one of a of a kind of anime. It's supposed to be this unique unraveling on time travel. Yeah, people talking about the thumbnail. Yeah, uh, big fan of Steins Gate. Um, but honestly, I was just looking for cool programming images and fan. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm still looking for a code name for 1.4 release. So, um, people have um, ideas. But yeah, I don't think it's a time travel one. Um, I think we're going to be looking. Um, we're going to be looking tonight at a few things, uh, mainly uh, updates, to resources, updates to stores and um, updates to compilation. Um, I'm going to kind of bucket it that way. So yeah, anyway, if you're here, come say hi in the chat. Um, gl glad to have you. Change up my drink tonight. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, how are you doing? Hi, thanks. Thanks for saying hi. Yeah, I'll just give people a minute or two to join on. Um, I'm actually pretty excited for this week in JavaScript too, because uh, uh, there's there there's some conversations, some React ones, and um, yeah, actually, you know what? This this week feels like vindication. So yeah, we're, we're gonna have some fun with it. Yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Steins Gate on full, at, in full effect tonight. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining. Hey, Oren. Uh, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, let's see here. Let, let, let me share my screen at least. Make sure it doesn't... Uh, die like it did the, the other time. All right, I think we're good. All right. Yeah, the dishwasher finished, yeah, thank you. That's what that notification was, yeah. Just in time, too, yeah. See my kitchen sort of blurred out in the background. Oh, I left the cupboard open. Uh, give me one second, otherwise um, Michael Rawlings from Marco's wife will make a comment. I'll be, I'll be right back. Is solid JSX and solid template literals the same speed? Um, very, very close. Um, uh, it's close as I could get it. Uh, it. It has most of the optimizations. It doesn't have the effect grouping optimization. Um, and it and it's a little heavier on lo load up. The biggest thing with the template literals is that the code side is bigger because you have to bring in like an HTML parser. The approach we did to temporal literals isn't just like use hyperscript like most people do. We actually do a mini compiler. So it actually compiles um, sort of very similar to the JSX, which is why Solid's template literals are one of the po possibly most performant template literal uh, solutions that's out there, period. Hey, okay, good. Yeah, I think we got some people here now. That's that's great. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we get started with uh, This Week in JavaScript? Okay, so let's 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 uh, let's get our let get my screen up here now. Okay, well, um, I'm going to start off with this little demo here. I saw this and I thought it was so cool. We talked about this. I think we've even talked about it on stream when the Marco guys are here, but um, it might be hard to see here without zooming in a bit. But essentially, someone took Astro and have it rendering in a service worker. But what's really cool about it is it's a partial service worker. So like you go to one page here, it loads it from the service worker without going to the server. Go to a different page, it goes to the server. And what they're doing here is they're toggling offline mode to show you that when you go to that page, it actually is gone. Other pages, it's fine when you're offline. Um, the reason this is interesting is I, when I first saw this kind of stuff, I was just like, 
like what gives, like who cares? You, I mean, a single page app is probably simpler if you're going to render everything in the client, you know, single app view. But if we're moving to this world where we have this kind of more multi-page app, partial hydration kind of mentality, um, putting the server in the service worker, let's um, keep a single app mentality, like, like not single app, but rather like a single approach. You're not like going, okay, now I'm in spa mode. I was in MPA mode, now I'm in spa mode. Like you get to keep the same paradigm. So I think that we're going to see more of this in the future. And you can see the layers, right? It's like service worker, edge worker, something near the server. I think I, I wouldn't be surprised we get to a point in the future in which you go and click deploy to Cloudflare or Netlify or whatever and, and Vercel, and you literally just spread it across the infrastructure. Like I have code that runs close to the database. I have code that runs um, on the edge close to the end user. And then I have you know code that um, you know maybe runs in the browser. And what's cool is if you use this paradigm, it is conceivable that you could have a single paradigm across it all. Um, so I think I think this is really cool. And I, it was kind of an inevitable uh, progression, but this is the first I've actually got, had a chance to see this. So I think I think I think that's awesome. Uh, what do we got here? I have more people talking off the main thread for the win. Yeah, I would I, I, I'd like to I'd like to see more on this. Honestly, there are some discussions this week talking about that. And so far, it's been prohibitive um, from like a framework perspective. Like, don't get me wrong, like things like Party Town do really cool things of offloading the main thread. You know, you're fine if something takes longer if it's not important. But integrating it into the framework itself is interesting. And I think, I think we're gonna have to experiment and see where that goes. Thus far, just like WebAssembly, it, it's just like not quite there yet. But um, I feel like we're getting closer and closer. I got a, a, a web worker framework was actually shared with me this week and that I kind of like, okay, I wanna benchmark this, you know? It's been a few years, maybe we're, I don't expect it to do amazing, but like maybe we'll get close to it. This might be a topic for another stream. Okay, let's keep on going. Um, what do we got here? Obviously, solid hack um, finished up. Um, uh, this was just the announcement for that. I can kind of jump ahead to sh to talk about that for a second because, like, why not? Um, but uh, yes, more warning. Yeah, here we go. Um, it's over now. Um, three great projects won. Honestly, there were so many amazing projects. Um, I couldn't be happier with the results. Um, we started this, you know, and and thinking like, okay, well, maybe some, you know, people will like try solid and, you know, have a reason finally to, to jump in and try it. And, you know, in the process, maybe we could get some useful libraries, you know, out of it. Like, and it, we, it, it exceeded my hopes, uh, especially with stuff like Hope UI, um, Suid, I think you pronounce it, the material design port. We got solid table, which is the React uh, table port. And like just so Turbo Query, which is like React Query, like so many um, really useful um, foundational libraries. We have one for forms, I think one for, uh, yeah, like there's just so many libraries and cool showcase apps. And one thing that I think we found is, is like it, a lot of this wouldn't have maybe happened if Solid had React Compat. It's kind of a funny way of looking at it. But in hindsight, I think it's maybe kind of a blessing because like, Yes. Now, in order to make a library, someone has to go through the effort to port it. That's that's that sucks, perhaps. But if someone wants to port it and goes through the effort, and now now it's their library, it's their thing. So in the end, the hackathon wasn't really just about get you know having more libraries in the ecosystem. It actually brought us new, really talented, amazing people um, who built these libraries and projects. Um, and I, I hope they stick around to see to see you know the outcome of what they built because I, I think I think we're starting on a, you know our own foundations and it's amazing. Um, it's happened way quicker than you know I expected. The the hackathon was amazing from that perspective. The the today to, to be able to start on solid and be like yeah I, I feel like I want some material UI or I want I want to do something kind of like chakra or do like headless thing and, and just have those pieces available to you. It's like a game changer and. Um, I mean, it's kind of proving the point in the vision, like that, you know, this is a framework that can do those things, right? So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about the hackathon all together. 
Um, okay, let's let's scroll back a bit because I kind of jumped straight there because I said there's a lot of spicy ones this week. Um, yeah, am I there yet? Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about this one. They, they haven't shown it to us yet, but Next.js has teased their the router, and I've been sort of suggesting that this was going to happen on stream for months now. In fact, um, I've been waiting for this. You know, every time there's a router conversation. I, I flag it in our this week in JavaScript so that everyone pays attention to it. Um, this is this is very important. As I said, this isn't just about like nested routing. Nested routing has been around forever. Like it, for people who aren't clear on that, Ember Router in 2012 brought nested routing to the client. React Router One in 2014, I think, had nested routing. Um, my web component router you can check out from 2014 also had nested routing. Um, at some point, you know, patterns changed. And we kind of got away from that um, in React land. I think it was React Router 4. But like for certain types of frameworks like ours, um, you know, ones that didn't use VDOM, you need to use nested routing. Otherwise, it's very wasteful. So it's like no surprise to me that we're we're kind of coming around back to nested routing. It's just it's just a really good pattern um, for uh, data parallelized fetching and stuff. And um, even though like it's getting a lot of attention now because of Remix and Next. I just wanted to kind of point out that we've had it. This isn't like a, a secret. We've had that forever. However, this is a big deal because the read between the lines here is they're, they, they're actually looking for a nested routing solution that works with server components. That's why they think Next.js, you know, they've been fine with their patterns, what they do. They, they, didn't, they didn't need to make a nested router. But the reason this is here is because Server components essentially work off like a full page reload and diff, and that's kind of heavy sometimes when you don't need it. And I, I think, and I've been saying for a while that in the future of this transitional app type thing, that nested routing is going to be a key part to reduce the the, the pieces, like the partialness of it. If, if you are interested on this topic, though, to get more into it, watch the stream I had with the Marco uh, core team and myself. We spend a lot of time talking about the routing and what the future of the web is. That's probably one of the best streams I have on um, kind of like future facing what, what what it looks like. But this this is this this is showing me that Next and and um, React is well on its way. And the thing is, if they go this way, Remix will probably begrudgingly press me at first, but they'll adopt it too. This is we're starting to see the future of of where things are happening from the React ecosystem side. Um, the rest of us got to keep on pushing forward because we should. We don't want to be playing catch up here. What stream? Uh, I, I was just talking about, I, I did a stream, uh, you can find it on my channel. Um, I'm not going to pull it up right now, but um, with the Marco team where I talked a lot about the routing. Um, and actually came up on my screen with um, Misko Heavery. I'm excited for next to, to be honest. Auto imports deploy on the edge along the Nitro engine seems promising. Yeah, I, I, Nuxt is something I don't know a ton about, and I might actually cover it um, on another stream because um, they they've been really pushing innovation. Um, I think more on the like what I call it, like the deployment side, like like make sure like the the whole like the system is robust. Where I, I focus a lot on the rendering and the, like the core raw mechanics. So this is an area where it can inevitably get you. When I was talking earlier about splitting your stuff along with your infrastructure, I feel like Nuxt is going to be there before others, at, like understanding how that works. You know, and um, yeah, I, I I'm interested to see that too. One of the th things is like right now, almost all the frameworks have the same story. You have like Vite under the hood and these deploy adapters and literally everyone is uh, just like, like they all work on the cloud, they all work on the edge, they all use request response. Like in a sense, you could, it, 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 you can look at Remix, FeltKit, Solid Start, Astro, you know, even, and Marco actually is in that category now too. Um, you know, uh, there's probably more, I'm gathering that Nox is on that chain and they're all kind of this, the same from that perspective, like that capability thing. What's interesting to me is where, you know, some libraries like perhaps Nux are building more on top of that. That's not really an area that I'm focusing on so much, but the fact the work is being done, I have a lot of respect for and probably something I'm gonna to wanna to dig into sometimes in the future. 
anyway, uh, next next one I got here is uh, Mishko Heavy has been on a roll. You know, um, we've been talking a lot about um, resumability and we talk about and hydration. We talked about that last stream. Um, not my most viewed stream, I have to say. Whenever I talk about hydration, those streams don't um, seem to do as well. Funny enough, it's like, uh, uh, I don't know. My, my, just for anyone who knows, my most viewed stream to date right now is the one that I did with Next.js. And I, I think that's kind of funny because for me, that stream was just kind of like a vanilla stream. You kind of just go in, try it, realize that Next and Remix are basically the same thing, and then say, well, good stream, guys. And, and probably the, the, the highlight of that stream was realizing that Next had anchor tags inside their links and people watching me refactor every single one, one at a time. If there was a if silver lining out of it, it was that a week later, um, Next announced that they were getting rid of the necessary anchor tag. That probably had nothing to do with us, but you know, good timing. But um, I think the the stuff, especially like the Marco stream, the Quick stream, and the Hydration stream, have so, you know the last two I did, especially on like the breaking down the web, have a lot of really really good content for people who don't know much about these topics. Um, Mitchko has been digging. Deep though, like finding a specific topic and really getting down to the um, to the core of it. Because, I mean, you got to figure where he's sitting right now. It feels a bit like a gold mine. Like he's he's onto something with Quick, you know. And we feel the same way with Marco Six. Um, and um, so he, he's th th this latest one. He's citing that um, it's not your fault your site's slow. It's the framework. So you need a better framework. Um, that's a pretty bold me message. You can go read this article and see if you agree. Um, I, I think you know there's, there's, it's a complicated issue, and whether you believe or you know that you should drop what you're doing and pick up quick right now or or not, um, the clear thing from the article that I think you should take away is that bundling is slowly creeping into the domain of the framework, and whether you view that from a meta framework standpoint, like you know, like the fact that like it's all in, like like you know, like like Remix or something where you're like, here's your solution, don't worry about it. Or Next, same idea. But I mean more specifically, even stuff like, you know, Marco, they actually built their own bundler back in the day because of the need for it. And, you know, Quick and Astro, the way, like partial hydration um, and, you know, Quick's progressive resumability are bundler tricks. So you, it, the framework has to be able to have control over it. And I think that's really should be the takeaway. Basically, the, the framework's um, region of control has expanded. Um, so to kind of combat this, you know, site getting slow as complexity grows thing. So, yeah, whether you agree that it's the framework's fault or not, um, there was actually a really funny discussion a few weeks back that we covered. I, I guess it was a month back where Evan Yu and Alex Russell were discussing this very topic and and. Alex was like, it's the framework's fault. And Evan, you was like, it's the frameworks don't get to fix this. Um, they're both kind of, you know, right. I think the frameworks can do better. Um, but I, I think I think there is a bit more to it than that. But anyway, it's a good article. You can check it out. Um, okay. So let's talk about use event. All right. If you're involved in the solid community, you know this one was a heyday for us. It was. It's always going to be a heyday for us when this happens. And I don't want to. I I didn't want to be like too much on it because, like, let's let's face it here. React has a different model, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But it it is a model that works that is consistent. They've had to kind of jump through hoops a bit to kind of get it to where they want. But for them, it is a sound approach, you know, based on academic functional programming patterns that they've kind of ad adapted or adopted into their world. So when I see use effect, or sorry, use event, I'm like, yeah, this solves a real pain point, you know? Um, there was that whole uh, set interval example that everyone likes to show with solid use event is like, here is the, the way to do it. Like, here's the solution. Don't play around with this other stuff. We're giving you the solution. And it's a solution that makes sense. You can do it today. You can basically just use a, a, a ref in react and, re and use callback in combo 
and pull, pull, pull this off. Um, but they made a hook that makes just makes it easy. And I don't know if, does everyone understand what this hook does? Because essentially, I think it confused some people, but all it does is it reruns every time as if you didn't even have a hook there, except it keeps a stable reference. And by that, I mean, the thing that it returns doesn't change. So it doesn't trigger downstream changes. So you're kind of safe to have to, to get rid of the stale closure, like to have it always update on every render and not worry about the stuff below it, below it, below it rendering. So in a sense, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like the, their untrack, um, if, if it helps you from a reactive standpoint, it's like their, their version of untrack. Um, I always find it funny because React's versions are always like the opposite of ours. Like, like it works like exactly opposite. Some, how is something that always reruns untrack? You're probably asking, but that, that is actually um, the, like the, the way that you can look at these as like analogous. Now, the reason it was interesting to me wasn't because of what it did. It was because it's called use event. And that's a very specific language. Why do you call it use event? And the answer to that for me was you're trying to tell the developer how to use it. You're not saying this is what it does. You're saying use it for events or this indicates it's an event and event in a fairly general sense of the word, not just event handlers like, um, like, you know, you register the DOM, but any kind of like thing where something would call you from the outside, like a set interval or something and where you're going to kind of like enter into your reactive system, set some state. That's an event. And I saw that and I was like, compiler hook much? Like th th that is why they're doing this. This is a language thing. This is, this, they're, they're gearing up for compilation. Like we saw React for Git. I was kind of skeptical. I'm like, is this for real? This is, this is telling me 100% it's for real. They, they are serious about React for Git. Because when you start adding these kind of hooks, you start building up. This isn't just a, like a mechanical hook like use effect. This is like use event. This is a, an event. So like, uh, yeah, this is, this is very much like uh, an intentional language thing. And then you, I, I, like four hours later, our compiler guy, Hux Pro, um, who's been working on the React forgets thing goes, this Use event has a deeper meaning to React than yet another nicer use callback. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth to introduce a new first class concept. It's a step towards our new automated world. So th thank you, um, th thank you, uh, you know, for confirming that this is all about the compilation. Um, I've actually I've been I've been following uh, Hux Pro here um, recently, and it's been really getting into the conversation like what's reactivity and stuff. I, th I think they're really kind of opening up their mind to kind of look at what that whole problem space is. I, see, I have a theory here and I don't know if it's going to hold up and we'll, we'll have to see. But when you start getting into heavy memoize land, um, which is basically what this React Forget is and kind of actually how Svelte works. Svelte is still kind of top down, um, but it's heavily memoized. So there's a, there's a ton of similarities between Svelte and Re React Forget. Um, even though it's this kind of still top-down run thing, things don't always run. And once you get into a model where things don't always run, and you can say, well, hooks, things don't always run. But the thing is, once you kind of bury that and it's not the hooks, it, you're actually naturally memorizing, the end user no longer has the indication of why or when things no longer run. The easiest explanation for that is it's declarative, that it's reactive, in fact. It isn't about... It doesn't matter that it isn't actually using a reactive system like Vue or Solid. Like Marco, six to degrees along these lines. It's that once you no longer are looking at a pure top-down or at least augmented top-down kind of like, you know, with data points to hint it, mechanism, you no longer can make sense of it in that way. And it's easier to view it like code that executes when things change. You, you, you invert it. It's kind of like the way reactivity works. In fact, Dan explained um, somewhere in here, 
I, I've got probably going to find it, find it again, but he was actually explaining effects to someone in here the way I explain effects in solid, which is not how they look and react. Someone pointed out to me and they're like, they're like, this isn't true. And I'm like, no, I mean, technically react doesn't work that way, but he's explaining it to them talking about dependencies of effects, you know, the same way that we talk about in reactivity. So I've been saying for a while now that reactivity is a language that it's um, it transcends implementation and the further react approaches memoization, the closer they come to con converging with a reactive type mentality. The thing is, it's not necessarily reactive in the classic sense. So they can kind of keep it like that. It's their mentality that they've always had, but I think it's going to, it's a bit of a stretch. We'll see, but that's my hunch here. And honestly, that le leads right to my next post here. Um, and I think we should get into that, but I'm going to check what's going on with chat for just a second. Why is it called use effect? The same thing they tried to ask you not to do is set state inside use effect. Sorry, it's called use event. I, I said use effect by accident here. I, I saw solid docs and really press solid provide store ready photo. It's a definitely solve a, one huge pain point of React. So how do you learn? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the reason solid has a store and has this stuff is I had like a store before I had a renderer, if that makes sense. Like when I start solid, I wasn't like figuring out rendering techniques really well. I was actually working with proxies. I was like, how can I do reactivity um, with plain objects? You know, I, I knew I'd get into rendering and I, I did some like string template kind of stuff, kind of really similar to Vue actually. Um, but I, I really focused on having these kind of primitives right from the start, you know, back in, you know, 2000, I guess early 2016. So, yeah, I mean, for me, this is just a logical thing. I actually pulled stores further out to kind of help people differentiate them and realize that there's a point to get to. But we're going to cover stores a bit tonight more, and I think that it will make more sense. Yeah, yeah, Nick's talking about this. Yeah, yeah. He, he, I, do you agree, Nick, that, that essentially he described effects in React the same way we would describe effects in solid. It's not like actually the way React works. I think they're testing this communication mechanism because people are like, it makes sense. It's like, it's <laughs> reactivity makes sense. Um, hooks are more complicated. They still make sense. I actually have appreciation for hooks when you start thinking about it, like in terms of the patterns they have, but hooks obscured behind a memoizing compiler, I. I'm concerned they stop making sense unless you explain them like reactivity. We actually hit this more brainstorming with Marco because we had a bit of a split, you know. So I love being on a team of three guys in that in that sense. And because Dylan was like initially really on the like, well, let's keep a top-down mentality. You know, I like the VDOM, I like the way that executes. And I'm just like, what are you we talking about? Like fine grade stuff all the way, like just do this. Like we we hit a problem like with a set timeout and we're like, should the inside of the set time out track or not track? And I was like, not track, it's obvious. And Dylan's like, well, no, it should track, it's obvious. And poor Michael's in the middle going, well, I think for this one, it should track, but, you know, and, and he kept putting him in the middle. And my, my point is eventually realizing where we came to, Dylan actually kind of revised and came around a little bit because he was like, he was like um, he was like, like, don't get me wrong, Dylan, Dylan was ultimately the one who convinced me to, on uh, two-way binding um, for Marco. Um, but what, the, the thing is, we realized when we ran it, like no matter how much we tried to keep the top-down VDOM model, once we added the level of optimization and memoization, it no longer made sense as explanation. We couldn't explain it to someone that it worked that way anymore. And I, I suspect the React team will find the same. So they're going to start explaining stuff. And it's going to, the explanations might start sounding a bit more like solid, even if they don't actually execute that way. So I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, 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 exactly. It's a good way to explain things. <laughs> that's all I got to say. I mean, it makes my life easier. It makes our life easier because I've been trying to explain people this stuff that ways and people come at me and they're like, someone describes solid as riding your bicycle with the handlebars turned backwards. And I'm like, 
how do you know you haven't been riding with the handlebars turned backwards this whole time and I just fixed it for you? Um, if React and the messaging continues to turn this way, it's just going to make it look like 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 that. I, I think this is a tricky place to be in. Um, but it's, you know, I think on the other hand, the React team knows where they're going. And I think they will figure out how to ease everyone into it. And that's what this is about. At some point in this thread, someone someone's like, hey, Dan, you know, thanks for this whole thing. Seems like user event is expanding on the React as a language thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is great. After playing with libraries like Solid, however, it's nice not to have to worry about any of this stuff. I mean, I'm just paraphrasing, but he's basically saying, I've never scaled up Solid, so I don't, you know, understand what the trade-offs are, but basically it seems really super great. That, that's essentially what they're doing. You know, and I'm going to look more at this. That's that's essentially what he says. And and Dan goes, I agree with you. It'd be nice not to worry about it. And our hope is the compiler work will solve this. I think sometimes it comes off like we're locked into our current approach, though. We generally like our program model. If we thought Solid was better, we'd move to that. I like this quote for so many reasons. Because... Not, I mean, some people saw this and they're like, is he kind of giving you guys like a backhanded thing, you know? And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not what he's saying here. He's saying they believe in what they're doing. And if they believe differently, they would have built something different. Like they're not like second guessing themselves. This has been a long run trajectory and, and they know their path. And this is true. Even when they introduced React hooks, they gave zero kind of, you know, they did a prior art thing for React Hooks. You can still find up the document, actually. You know, let's do this right now. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, let's see if I can find the React Hooks. Uh, what was it? Release announcement. Let's see if we can find it. Or maybe React Hooks prior, prior art. Is there, is there is it prior? Hook synthesized ideas of several different sources. Our old experiments in React Future Repository, React Community Experiments with Render Props, including Rand Florence's, Dominic Ganaway's Adopt Keyword Proposal, State Variable state Cells in Display Script, Reducer Components in Reason, Subscriptions in Rx, and uh, Algebraic Effects in Multicore OCaml. Do you know something that's not on this list? Fine-grained reactivity. And I've been saying this for, for a while now. Fine-grained reactivity looks a hell of a lot like hooks and is what you know, like what we use in solid, and it was in knockout and you and older svelte, and you know, like that did not influence hooks while looking identical to it. And the reason is the React team very much believes in what they're doing. They are not going to, like MobX is in React and had similar things that look like hooks. And again, not even a nod here. They're not going to go this way. They've never liked this way. They still don't like this way. You know, this is this, there is no risk here of React absorbing solid space in the ecosystem. They, they legitimately dislike the approach and think that it's limited in some way. And maybe that's fair, but that's, I mean, I, I, you know, I am kind of almost the opposite. I am so confident in this approach. You know, it puts us a bit at odds, but this draws a line here for people because people keep on seeing solid and they go, oh, oh, React's just going to do that. You know, React is never going to do it. <laughs> like this, this, this is, this is so, I, I've been waiting for someone on the React team to actually just say that. He says, if we thought it was better, we'd just move to that. But that's not, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying, he's not saying like, oh, if at a point solid, you know, shows that its models, you know, really good, we're going to move to it. No, he, what he, he's saying is we're, we're, we're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you know that's good. I like that React is different, and they are going down 
that approach because they're showing they're taking that paradigm and taking it as far as they can as well as they can and all we can do is you know show respect to that is take the other paradigm and take it as far as it can right you know i got into this because i kind of felt that fine grain reactivity was criminally underrepresented. And I could blame React because React sort of killed it last time. Like React came out killing libraries like Solid. That's what it came out of. Like the older versions of uh, the predecessors, React basically was like, no, that's not how you do it. This is how you do it. Yet when hooks came out, I was just like, whoa, you, you guys are <laughs> you guys are treading pretty close there. Um, and you know, that's fine. Maybe they learned something. So, you know, I learned something from React and that's where Solid came out of. And, you know, regardless of how I feel about Dan's statement in terms of, and how the React core teams feels about reactivity, they know where they're going and they know what they're doing. So don't bug React about, or don't bug React or Dan about, about Solid. That, like they're not gonna change, like ever. If you want to show Dan, as I said, how good this approach is, just let's let's build some stuff you know that, that's 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 my takeaway here like like it, it's yeah, I, I i think i think that, that that's that's really the the thing here right because this this use event thing obviously uh let me get back here kind of did trigger more conversations right like um, I didn't show this yet, but like, if I go back to this thread, you know, where, where they're talking, you know, some people are like, you know, kind of sarcastically like, oh, seems like so much discussion, thought, time, resources, company, employees, money, is important to an idea that doesn't even need to exist in li libraries like Solid, you know, patch the patches. And I was like, well, someone's going to make a meme out of this. Like, use event is just, you know, it's like use callback and use ref, you know. And sure enough, <laughs> like 500 likes. Geez, yeah. This this is like better than any post I've done myself. This 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 is how you went on Twitter, right? I mean, some people don't get the joke. I think sometimes Solid Group um, makes jokes that are kind of a bit too cerebral. Like someone was like down here, they're like Svelte version, you know? Like the the, the joke is that this is nothing. It's just a function that returns itself. It's an identity function. Like, um, as I mentioned, some people went a little crazy. I, I, I'm surprised I didn't get a PR for this one. Um, but it really has no place in the reactive models and it is invented for this purpose. But I think this, this actually did spawn an interesting conversation. And I'm gonna share that with you all here a bit because it pulled out our man, Sebastian Mark Bage, who I have an incredible amount of respect for. He's the guy who's been building that router over and next we talked about. He's been the visionary um, behind React for years now. And he basically was curious, I guess, how to remake this using something like Solid, right? He want, and he should, we used, he used one of the examples. And, and as, and what he he was like, he was trying to show this kind of let create use callback create keys crypto stuff and show like where you have a case where you have, you know, a function that depends on one thing and then when you call it, you somewhere else needs this so it has two dependencies one that's kind of bundled with the function and one that's like where you locally use it like in the in the effect that you use it. And he was trying to say like, this is why we need this pattern. And he's like, I tried to do it in solid. And I think it's something like this. Um, I think he'd write like signal and he, he, he does this whole thing. And he's wondering if there's a more idiomatic way. And I, I love this thing because I think this is so illustrative here. If you see what he's done here, he's created a signal and then he has a render fact that listens to the public key. And then it sets a function this isn't quite the right syntax or solid. Doesn't know if solid has function setters, but he sets a function um, so that create keys is a function, and then somewhere else you'd call it like a function that calls a function essentially. Like you'd have like a double function call. You'd like have a signal with a function in it. And he 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 went on and he's like, I think in Svelte it's like this. 
which is a little bit better, right? He has it. And then in here it tracks and it sets it to keys and this, and I, I looked at this and I'm like, okay, well we can do better than your example, right? Seb, like if, if this is the equivalent Svelte and if you know Svelte, like this is, this is a derivation. It's you assigning a function to key and it's under dollar sign. I was like, the equivalent to that Svelte code in solid is this. So we've already shrunk it down a bit. It's just literally create keys, create memo, public key, return the function, you know? But then I was like, you know what, Seb? In solid, you wouldn't do any of this. In solid, you'd literally just write a function that calls a signal. And then where you use it, you just call your argument. And it automatically can track both dependencies. You don't need to, you don't need to like ever pretty much like memoize a function. Like, why are you memoizing a function? You just have two, two data dependencies. So literally have one wrap close over one data dependency, have the other close over the other dependency where you call it. Like you still, in all his examples, he was only showing this part. He wasn't showing this part. You always need this part in, in his example. You always need the effect that you call the create keys on. So essentially our answer to his whole thing where he was showing the use callback and all that stuff is literally write a function. So I think there's still parts that are missing in our model from their perspective. And I hope that these kind of conversations continue because like, as I said, solid version, create keys, pass, it's just literally a callback function. You don't need any create callback, don't need any dependencies, don't need this. You just literally have a function calls a thing compared to the, the React for, no, sorry, that's the, the solid version, the React version. Use callback, like it, it's the same thing, right? We, it should have been obvious at the beginning. You just erase the use callback and that's how solid works. Yeah, I do have a nice shirt, check this one out. You guys check that out? Yeah. Right, so like w w when we joke about um, Oh, you want to see what, he, what Seb said at the end? It's a fair response. He was like, yeah, that's pretty neat. That only works if you call it inside something that tracks, which again, is what you're doing here because you're calling it in fact and not async callback, sure. You almost want to tag it, especially in that case, which seems like a reasonable answer from where he's sitting until you realize that like literally everything in solid works this way. Do you know what I mean? Like that is the model. I, I kind of joke about it because people talk about like the hook rules and stuff. And I'm like, so, solid's like fight club. Like we, we, we only have one rule. Um, it's not the same rule as fight club ad admittedly, but we have like literally this one rule that will smack you in the face over and over again until you be listen to it. But it's not like a, a bunch of different rules. There's, you just have to respect retaining reactivity. You have to, you have to access values where they're tracked. That's, that's the rule. Don't destructure, don't put, like it's literally just this one rule. And maybe that's, and, and Vue has that rule too, and MobX, and it just comes with this kind of reactivity. And maybe that sucks, maybe the user experience is too complex. But if you, if, if you're in this world, this kind of thing is a good point, but you, like the whole app, you're already building this way. This is not even like a thought. It's it's just literally the model. Um, it's And it's kind of funny because like, when I was talking to Huxpro about reactivity, and he was asked, he asked this, he did this poll and he was like, is reactivity the source of the reaction? And I'm like, no, it has to be both. Like it's a system. It, it, reactivity is a declarative system living in an imperative world. So it's, it's kind of like to itself, it's the universe, but we live, it's like, it's like pretending you're on a 2D plane and all you can see is in 2D. And th that is the world. Um, and that's our declarative reactive system. It has no sense of time. It, everything is synchronized. It only has its like its dimensions, which is like s state always reflects what it is. Unfortunately, we live in a world, a 3D world, where we can see that the reactive system is just like a piece of paper on our desk. But essentially, in its zone, it has complete domain. It's only when you look at it from an outside influence that um, you you start talking about like these imperative things like it is it is kind of pure in itself and 
I, I guess that's just like my kind of view on it, but I just like you, you enter this paradigm. That's how it works. This kind of comment makes sense from the outside, but if you solve it for a bit, you're just like, yeah, well, I mean, of course, it, like, it's like, it's, it's akin to like, of course, hooks go in a component. I mean, in our case, they, they don't, but you know what I mean? Does anyone like question and react why hooks are in components? So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, this is, it, this is, this is an easy thing to make when you're used to the other patterns, but it is just the one, it, one thing, right? You, like, so yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the conversation here. I thought this was really, really great though, because this, this, you could see this development of this conversation because you could see starting here, thinking of reactivity like this, when really most of the time, it isn't about creating all these extra signals and synchronization. The, the beauty of reactivity is once you're in that world, you actually just delete stuff. You just go bye bye. Use callback. Bye -bye. Like you know, what I mean, you, just, you 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 actually subtract. It's not more. It's less. Um. So, anyway. Okay. So yeah, let's let's keep on going on. Unless anyone has any questions about this, I thought this was a great conversation though. This this whole uh, react reactivity use event thing really kind of highlighted it, and the way they changed their language to you know talk about effects and stuff, I, I think is just grand. I think, I think this is one of those situations where um, we're just sitting in a really nice spot because the further React explores this way, the better Solid looks. Um, and the, you know, it, 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 they're kind of validating our approach while saying it's completely different. Like, I think, I think this is just great, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where where did that expectation come from, though, right? It it's creates something, right? Uh, the funny thing is, like, before hooks, and I've talked about this before. I was I was sitting on different APIs, right? I mean, I can I can pull up a playground for right now to show you what, what what I was talking about. But before hooks, I was sitting there and I was like, okay, I got my signal, and the most obvious one, I was like, team knockout. I'd be like, signal. I'd be like, let's just go. Like this right and then be like set and read right let's just do this play this game for a second and be like okay so read is going to be like this and then set is going to be like this this is the most obvious starting point like I didn't like this. I'd use knockout for ages. And the fact that it's the same function and like someone accidentally does, you know, something like, oh, let's uh, set timeout signal because I'm like really thing or how <laughs> about promise dot resolve <laughs> or like something stupid like this. I mean, obviously, like this is obvious. Don't do this. But this, this bugged me and I, I didn't like how it kind of lended to this like anytime you pass this around someone could read and write to it right and then and then like i was like okay well let's let's look at what mobx does and mobx was like okay well this is easy we go signal dot get and signal dot set and i was like okay this isn't bad and I was like, uh, well, it's kind of bulky. So maybe what we could do here instead is be like, what if we just did get set and there, I kind of don't like this though very much. So instead I'm going to, I was like, I mean, you could do some cool stuff here. You can go alias like, and this be called count. And then, I mean, this isn't too bad, right? Nah, this is too much. Like, I'm never going to do that. I, I might as well just call it like n name the variable 
count and then go count on the other set. Like it just wasn't worth it. And then I was like, okay, okay, I'm gonna be really clever here. This is where I got to before Hopeless came out. I was like, okay, I got it, I got it. We're gonna, we're gonna keep our create signal, right? And instead what I'm gonna do is read like the first one, like here, and write like the second one. Do you follow me? Like, uh, let, let me show, show the third one. I'm, I'm gonna go signal, read like this, write like this this is this is where i got to right at, towards the end and i was like see a, a function is an object so we can hang stuff off of it so we can make the read first class and then we can kind of hide a setter on it with a dot set and my stored proxy design at the time it was kind of similar you would read it normally and then you'd have like a special set property that you could call on it and I was like almost pulling the trigger, but I'm like, man, this is too, this is too clever. Like I know that objects are function, or sorry, functions are objects, and and people who've been using JavaScript too. But trying to teach a beginner this syntax, like just like this, I think this is really good. It's probably one of the better options. But trying trying to teach a beginner this syntax, I was like, how do I explain to them they can do this? Why why am I teaching them like? what some people might consider quirks of JavaScript. So I'm, I'm sitting here playing with this for like two years, I kid you not, and just being like, you know, like just being like, you know, like not getting anywhere. And then I see the React hook demo and I'm just like, oh my God, the answer is so simple. It's so simple. You know, why why go through all this pain when you can just name it whatever you want and just go count, set count, like done. like. That's what I got from React hooks. This, I, I we were already using these like primitives and doing all this stuff. Literally, this I was just like, this is such this. Why didn't I think of this? I'm I'm, I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> like so like I think there's a bias that comes in from using React, but like to to me at least this is this is just like it. It's the obvious solution. If you want that read-write segregation, because like, even with this, I didn't like it because you still always pass the setter around. And I really like unidirectional flow. I used old knockout and old reactive libraries. It was like the butterfly effect. You'd like have some, some data down somewhere and someone would write to it. Like mutable proxies are the worst. Like, because someone can be like, someone can be like, okay, cool. I, I got a store here. And then I'm going to pass it in through my, my div and be like, okay, here's some prop. I'll, call it like uh, some user, okay? And then I'm gonna go store.user. And now in my, let's call this one user, in my user component. And then somewhere else further down the line, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be like, okay, well actually I want an address. And in address, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually pass in, um, uh, let's, let's call it address, but it doesn't matter. But it's, it's gonna be props.user, dot address and then in this component somewhere someone's like well okay i'm going to um i'm going to uh, store the address locally somewhere because i need to do some work on it so i'm gonna let me do that and then um and then what uh you know or actually maybe temp address and then and then they're like okay well temp address um, street um, let's 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 change street to um, mulberry do you see what they've done here they they, 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 they actually updated our store and I, like this is this is bad. Like it doesn't matter if your framework has two-way binding checks. Like if you have mutable things, there is no like two-way binding. There's there's no two-way binding uh, checks. Like sorry, further down here, it isn't user dot address. Sorry, we we passed it here. It's actually props dot address. You know, they they, they they you know maybe they destructured it. Maybe it's actually. Yeah, whatever. You, you get my point. Like, 
yeah, with knockout and the functions, it was like he was like terribly bad. Like you, you just you you're playing ping pong. Like someone changes something here, and then like up five components, three components down, like everything's firing. I, 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 I was not playing this game. Um, that's fine. People in view seem to like this, but I like Svelte guards against this. But this, like, literally, you can override two-way binding because you can always get past any read-only level to get to the next level. Unless you go and then read-only everything on purpose. Like, you have to, like, or make memos around them, like, wrap them in, in like, you basically have to use other mechanisms to wrap things that are expensive and more computations, you know, like if, if, if we wrap this in a create memo or computed, then you can't edit it, you know, in the same way. But like, essentially, like, th this just solves the whole thing. Like, like I just really didn't want to do this. Right, and which is the same reason why we didn't talk about it, but there was a, a third option. Our signals could have done something like uh, const signal equals create signal zero. And we could have done something like signal dot value, signal dot value equals 10 or something like this. This is just, I mean, beyond the obvious problem is you can't destruct your value. Sure, I mean, we have that problem. Anyway, you're, you're like you're opting straight into to like I don't know. It just it's a lot of. I mean, you can make the word value shorter. It's just like you, we, at the beginning we were looking for stuff that was ergonomic. Like like this is always going to be plus six characters or whatever. Like I don't know. And the mutation problem stuff. I just React hooks are a brilliant API. I've always loved their API. So um, that's. That, that 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 that's enough of me probably spilling about that. Let me see if I can catch up with chat. You guys have been going a mile a minute. Yeah, yeah, exactly, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's fine. If you want to name it get count, then go for it. I just um, what, what's really cool is. You, like everything is a function uh, on the accessor side in solid. Like we did keep that bit of knockoutness. So um, never got into the whole get thing because like every derived, you, you, every function would start be, that wasn't a setter would start be calling get. Like what's cool is, I mean, I guess you could wrap setters and do it. I feel like the set being really explicit is really a good thing, especially in the naming, but like, you know, count, you know, count beginning double count, you know, because like what 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 what's uh what's double count right? Um, double count, for example, is just count. Is, should this be get double count? Like should we just keep on like I mean it's possible you know. And if that works for you, I think people should try it and see if that works for you. But nothing. The beautiful thing of the tuples is you can name stuff however the hell you want. So like as I said, just really brilliant API design. So, yeah, I, I essentially, the, the, we, we, we tangented pretty hard here, but I, uh, I don't even remember where we're, where, how we got here, honestly. It was just a comment in the chat. Um, I, I think React has taught us to be a certain way. I'm challenging that. that, that that's, what, that that's what we're doing here. We're challenging that. So, Right. That, that's 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 essentially it. it might be good in training materials. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's 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 what we're playing here. OK, let's keep on going. This week in JavaScript is the longest week in JavaScript, but it's a good one because I said this, this is this is stuff that needs to be said. And to have this kind of acknowledgement, this is like the first time I think Dan's ever publicly used the word solid on Twitter. Um, this 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 is that was like a other hidden thing. Like, I mean, obviously, I, I've talked to Dan before, you know, like. I, I, we, we know who each other are. Um, I had a nice chat with them uh, a month and a half or so ago. But like the, the, in public, this is a, this is a pretty big acknowledgement for my sense. So even if it, it sounds like he's like saying like we, if we thought this was good, we'd do it. Blah, blah, blah. Like it sounds a bit like that. That's not what's going on here. As I said, um, it's just it's not. It, they're set in their ways and they're doing their thing, which is great because it challenges us to think of how we can do th good things too. You know. If it wasn't for React, um, I probably never would have thought of doing something like time slicing concurrent rendering. I still don't know if that's something worth doing, 
but God, it's a lot of fun making those kind of demos, you know? So, you know, like there's a lot for everyone to learn all around. So I think, I think we're, I think we're getting, we're getting over that. All right. All right. Let's, let's get into more react. <laughs> I don't think anyone got my joke. See, I, I thought I was being funny here. Uh, Ryan Florence gave a great talk about streaming in Remix. Um, and he, and I, I made some joke about we're all on the same page. And like, I was trying to joke about the, like, like that in like solid and Marco, we've, we've been on this page the whole time, you know, and Remix was on this page and now we're on the same page. Yeah. Okay. Not, not really, not really funny, I suppose. Um, but um get into streaming i honestly th thought they were not going to um i had a bunch of conversations with ryan florence and um back in january like he went as far as saying the more experiment with streaming the initial document includes resource hints the more it seems that it's only useful when the user has a fast connection the server is slow and better investment gets fast basically he said that's like he didn't believe streaming was a thing um four months later that's his React thing, and he's explaining to people how like the benefits of streaming are. So, um, I'm I'm glad we're on the same page because it's it's a lot harder when you, like this is something you kind of face. We, we, we talk a lot about performance. We look into these things on the stream, and it's hard to kind of go out there and like talk about it. And then like you know, remix guys are like, oh, it's not worth it. We have partial hydration, same kind of thing. And then you're like, no, it is. We can show you, and it's like. You get person with 5,000 followers against person with like 100, like three people with 100,000 followers, you, you get squashed. It doesn't matter what you say. Um, the, like the message that carries is whatever they say. So now that we're on the same page and with the same message, that makes that makes me happy because it, now I don't have to fight like re-educating everyone afterwards. They're like, but Ryan said this. It's like, okay. I'll try and debunk it in the most politically nice way because there there is some big gaps here, and I I I you know I don't want to discredit anyone, but now we don't have to worry about it. Remix is on board with streaming. Well, well, mostly. Um, uh, to be fair, Ryan says he's like not completely on board. He's like I still think it's better to use Redis and skip streaming. So. Um, there it is. There's some skepticism there, but I mean, the talk was really great and I'm glad that's what people will hear. They won't hear him do this. It's the only 16 likes, not like 500. Um, but yeah, let's look at the talk. There we go, 736. This is what people will walk away with. This is the important part. So yes, streaming is great. And um, what one thing that is buried here, and the reason I wanna bring this up um, is that there's a secondary benefit here, if you're paying attention. Streaming unblocks server rendering. Remix has, like, maybe I should use a scale draw for a second here. But the way Remix has been working to date is pretend like you have a, a, a nested route, right? And I hope you guys know what that, that is now, right? It's a nested route is like, is like you have a page, and then there's maybe a section there, and then there is a nested route one here, which is I'm gonna do here, different color, and then we'll put nested route two in here, different color again, yeah, one, two, three. And the, th the thing is the way Remix works is you get a request and essentially when you're, when you're serving that request, Remix goes, okay, what's the route? So it figures out say all three levels and goes, um, I'm going to run, uh, I mean, so the first thing, and let's get some black text here so I can write. I'm gonna, the first thing is they go like, get the request and go run loaders A, B, C. Um, and, and they can run these in parallel, which is pretty sweet because they know the route information right at the beginning. And then they basically go like promise all. So it's more like, Promise all, you know, run these loaders, right? Okay. And then after that, they're like, okay, render to string. That, that's, that's how this works in Remix. 
But if you want to do streaming, you can't do this. This is blo blo blocking. You have to do all of this before you do this. So the, the way to get streaming to work is a slightly different series of things. It, it starts the same. And, and again, this is how it works in Solid and it, how it works in Marco, is you don't promise all it. You, I mean, I, don't, I guess Marco doesn't have an SD router, but like you can do the same thing. Run loaders A, B, C. This, so this is how it works in Solid Start. But then while those are running, you go, OK, render, render A. And then we'll make it two two A render B and uh, let's make a three or no a two B render C. But it can't render everything because there's some suspense boundaries and stuff, you know, here. And then maybe you know you're you're in here um, and there's actually um, actually yeah. Now I regret my numbering. It should be 3A and 4A. Sorry. Um, just like 2A, okay. What, what actually happens in here is that there's secretly other, let's say 2B, which is like suspense. In, in not all cases, sometimes suspense will block the child from coming in. But we're, we're just going to pretend in this case that it doesn't. It's kind of like, like this. And suspense. And I guess I should add the fan to it. Okay, cool. So what happens when, when you're working on um, kind of like solid or like a streaming solution is you you run the loaders then you render a hit the suspense it's fine you know maybe that blocks you but maybe that continues render b render c but you can't resolve the suspenses right but once you get to the end of the list here once you get down to five here like so let's say these b's like are i'm gonna maybe can i make them a different color to show that they they don't run yet that's not a good enough color um i need something lighter um, let's make something up. Let's make a, uh, like, uh, a, a, no, but it changes the lot. Damn it. I can't do it. Okay. No winning here. Um, essentially we skip all the suspenses the first time we get to five and then we stream the response and stream the shell. So at this point, when we stream the shell, we actually have maybe the outside of this stuff. And we just don't, we don't have some some content inside. And then as A and B and C finish, and they can finish independently, we then fulfill these suspenses and tag them on the end. So you end up with, and it, you know, you might end up with. Uh, sorry, let's get into this. You might end up with six um, A, which is resolved. Suspense A and you know and so on. Um, what, I don't know why I called it six A, but like seven resolves suspense B and eight resolved suspense C. And the reason I'm I'm showing you all this is not because you know the the cool streaming effect and the fact that everything loads early. It's not it's not because of like this table here. It's because um, look at all the work you did ahead of time while you were waiting for the loaders here. In the end, you rendered most, maybe most of the page, who knows, maybe not, but you may have rendered most of the page and you literally just have to fill in the gaps in some cases. Like sometimes, as I told you, these wrap, so it's more complicated, but it's in a sense, it is possible here that by unblocking the rendering on the server, you're actually not only because they're streaming sooner, you're actually improving um, like the what concurrency or whatever, like the ability to use the CPU on, on your server as well. Like it, ultimately, I guess maybe switching context might be more expensive on the overall CPU, but you're actually shortening the, the whole, the total time of your response because like you're, instead of like, 
wait for this rate to this, you're actually able to parallelize the rendering cost while the loaders are running and then finish the stuff that happens later. And like if A finishes before B, then, you know, you can finish this one up. You're, you're, you're actually like shrinking the whole bar when you go, when you go this way. So this is actually streaming or at least it doesn't even have to be streaming. Even if you wait to send the whole page at the end, you're actually improving your server rendering by using non-blocking patterns. So, yeah, I mean, this, this is kind of my perspective on here. So even if you want to be skeptical about streaming itself, it actually, I think, makes a better server rendering performance story um, when you render this way. And obviously, solids, async, and streaming both work this way. Um, very concerned with this thing. So I think, for me, the exciting part about it wasn't that Remix got streaming other than the fact that the social impact is good, you know, and people will actually, like, embrace it more. But that they are getting rid of this like enforced waterfall in order to do it. They're actually going to improve their rendering. So I think, I think this is actually a really good thing for, um, for remix as well. So um, yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's kind of one of those kind of hidden things perhaps, but I, I, I I'm just, I'm, I'm just glad the conversation's here. No more fighting with people trying to explain the benefits. No, you know, we, it, it, it's, it's now going to be pretty clear to everyone, I think. And this chapter, is is over for now okay and i think that brings us up to the end of this week in javascript if you're still with me you know good on you all right okay cool so time to switch gears everyone and let's talk about some stuff of Solid. I'm actually really excited about this. Um, I'm going to throw a banner up really quickly because um, I can. Let's do. Um, throw this one up here. So let's talk Solid 1.4. Um, Solid 1.4 is might be the longest of taking to release another minor version of Solid um, since I started. 1.3 came out like the beginning of January and it's been like what four or five months it feels like it's been it's been a while and part of it is I've been working on solid start I've been trying to find patterns I've done a lot of experimentation over this time period um, and it's funny enough usually what ends up leading to a release isn't that it's actually you know re recognizing that you need to like add some feature or thing that would be backwards breaking essentially and you're like okay it's time to kind of do all this stuff um, for us, it's often the compiler that did it. And we got a bunch of issues that kind of came up on the GitHub, um, a bunch of bugs, you know, and not a ton, but I, I figured, you know, let's just, oh, actually, this one's this one's solved in 1.42. Let's add that milestone. Um, essentially, 1.4 is going to solve every bug here. Um, and f as, as I mentioned before, there's basically three areas. Um, most of the stuff here is... There, there's some actual legit bugs like this error handling one, which, you know, is kind of interesting to fix. But we, we had a bunch of issues around inconsistent ha in handling um, in the compiler and especially around things like classes um, and attributes. And yeah, I, I want to show you, show you all something. This, this, this first one, I, I, what I'm excited most about 1.4 is I think it's an, a quality of life improvement. Um, this bug is very easy to reproduce. It's if people set class equals undefined and solid, your class name would literally be undefined because we would compile it to this. And I mean, if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, you can kind of see this. If you if you if you created an element, um, like a. Uh, Let's make a div. Okay, we made a div, and then you go l dot class name equals um, something doesn't matter, matter. And let's um, I think let's see if this works. Let's console log l. I think we'll get a visual of it. Yeah. See, you see class something, right? Now, if you go l dot class name equals empty string. This is kind of the fun part about the DOM. You get class with an empty string, unsurprising. If you go L dot class name null, you get 
literally the string null. And if you go L dot class name undefined, well, you get class equals undefined. This is this is kind of uh, I'm going to change my view here, so you, so I'm not blocking the screen. This is kind of frustrating because <laughs> um, you're like. How do you get rid of the stupid class, <laughs> right? And the reason we use class name is class name is more performant, right? That's why you use it. Even though this is a property, this just isn't helping us here. And for a lot of things, undefined is fine, but it's called using the platform. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it's called. It's called using the platform. Well, I I I I looked at um, Inferno for for some for some sage advice as I often do. Inferno when I, when I want to know how to solve a problem in a performant way, I, I looked at Inferno. Um, I feel like there are spiritual uh, godfather, um, different approach, um, different kind of view, VDOM and stuff. But you know, I have incredible respect for what what um, the work. Dom and um, God, why is his name um, Sampo um, has have been doing um, over the years, and the the answer to the solution is th there's only one way to, to to fix this problem. Unfortunately, only one way. L dot remove attribute class. So now class has to be special cased so that it sets with the class name and removes as a, so it sets the property and removes with the um, attribute. So it's, it's inconsistent. I can't use the attribute helper for it because I, because I don't want to take the performance hit class getting set as a, is a thing people animate with. So performance is important, but we're moving it. We have to switch it. So we actually, it works dual mode half prop, half attribute. So moving forward, solid is going to have a class name helper that does exactly that. Yeah, yeah, it, it, this is great, isn't it? So um, I, I'll show you, I'll show you the class name helper. I'll just pull up Dom expressions here for a second. Um, um, actually, oh yeah, it's on main because I already released it. But essentially, this is this is this is our new our new thing. Unfortunately, class name value double equal, so we coerce null or or undefined. Because I'm mean, false for a class. Probably actually, you don't want. But if someone did, yeah, actually, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Hmm. Anyway, generally speaking, um, but yeah. For for other things like attributes, you actually need the support false, technically speaking, um, because there are, like, don't get me started, there's Boolean attributes and then there's non-Boolean Boolean attributes. Um, but yeah, node remove attribute, otherwise set the class name. So now our, we have to have one extra helper, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's one that can get inlined, but just wanted to kind of show the kind of fun you have when you're working on a framework. Right, but this isn't a JSX problem. This is like literally the DOM, right? We actually don't use class name in our syntax. We use class um, for people. Like if, if Vue is handling this properly, for example, they are doing exactly this or they're just using the attribute and not going for the performance. Like this is this has nothing to do with the templating. It's, it's, it's literally how the DOM works. Um, like, yeah, it, 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 yeah, like it's, as I said, like in solid, our actual syntax for, for doing this um, is what div um, class equals something, right? You don't need to use that kind of silly JSX stuff, right? If I get rid of this, this, we'll see if I get rid of this one, the first one will still log properly. Yeah, just, you just do this side what note. For anyone who's skeptical of JSX, this is why I love JSX. Look what I just did. Th that's why JSX is sweet. You can literally just like be like, oh, oh, I need a div. I'm just gonna write some JSX. You like, you don't need a there's no template or anything like it. Just like 
here's a, here's a real DOM element, bam, right? Um, but okay, so yeah, this 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 one was kind of uh, it, it, this was kind of a pain. I mean, it is what it is, and I, I think I, I either do when you fix something in solid, you got to fix it in three places. You got to fix it in the compiler, um, and and obviously, like the class, the, the, I need to fix it. Sorry, like so the compiler generates stuff, and and like have this helper, and then I also have this fix spreads, and what's called the sign. So yeah, sorry, a sign prop. So spreads are suck because this is like when you have to basically revert back to VDOM. So yeah, this yeah prop class or class name cl called the class name helper. Yeah, so. Yeah, this one's not too bad, but like we had to hit it a couple places. Side note on this release, guys, big news, deprecating class name. We're not removing it, but TypeScript will no longer have a class main type. I'm gonna, having to merge the props, especially between spreads and not spreads and the complexity that comes with that, I do, as much as I like giving people flexibility, one thing that we're doing in 1.4 um, is gearing towards eventual removal we need a single way to set a single attribute because we want to get the most of our compiler. And if we have a runtime mechanism like a spread and a compile time thing, and they can't see each other, having multiple ways to set the same attribute creates a huge amount of complexity um, because they can trample each other without uh, being known to, to each other. So um, I, I, I did it originally to be flexible and be like, oh, you can just take your React code. Um, in the future, you will have to change all those class names back to class, um, unfortunately. Obviously, 1.4, we're not removing it yet, um, but we're going to we're going to start gently guiding people with TypeScript types and uh, uh, what do you call it, um, deprecation warnings and kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, 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 pretty much. And HTML4, both of those are like Reactisms that don't need to exist. They're not JSX, they're React. And um, we just don't need them. Yeah, so, I mean, I know it sucks. You guys have seen me on stream renaming classes to class name and, and like doing that whole d dance, um, you know, back and forth you know, going between React, it is a bit of pain. This is, this is just worthwhile pain. We'll cut load from the framework and it, this lets us optimize things. It, it also might mean a future where class and class lists become the same thing. We just have one super class um, mechanism that makes sense. You know, I, I think, I think, I think, I don't want to promise that just yet, but essentially we just, these, we, we're just inviting edge cases when you, you have two ways to do the same thing and they can like be done simultaneously between a compiler and runtime. We want to get the most out of our compiler. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. I like use CoffeeScript for years and like I, I, I never use ESLint. This is something we need to improve. Um, I, I, some people like make jokes that it's because I know what I'm doing. No, I've just, I've just never gone to tooling. I, I, CoffeeScript had crap tooling. So I'm like the worst person. People like, Evan Yu makes the best tools in the world. <laughs> um, and like, that's just not me. I, I'm i sorry. Like the, I, he, he probably caters to the devs in a way that they understand. I, I'm like a mechanics guy. I've just never, that's never been the thing, you know? Yeah, know why? React pollutes the global namespace. They're literally like global is us. Other JSX frameworks are a bit nicer. So you, you have to make sure your TS config wires stuff for solid. Otherwise, React just will come. You, you're just like, where is it? You know, like, no, React is behind every corner. Anyway, yeah. So I just want to mention some of this ones. I want to start with the bugs because these, I think this compiler stuff is important, but it's also the least exciting stuff. Spread null or undefined props. It's another similar kind of issue. Um, did you guys know? Here, things you learn while working on a framework that you never thought of. Let, let's 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 do this one. You can do this. Why? You know what else you can do? Can you do this? You can. 
Uh, why, 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 why? But you can. So solids, uh, yeah. and these are the kind of weird edge cases. The reason why you want to kind of reduce and just get as close to the platform in a sense as you can underneath. And when I say close to the platform, I don't mean web components. Those, those are something else. But I just mean like, like yeah, this 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 is kind of fun. Can we do this one? Let's let's see. Can we can we do false too? Can we like literally spread anything? Can I spread a number? I don't even know if this is working anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here you go, here's some JavaScript. Okay, I'm not worried about numbers because if people are spreading numbers, I mean, that's on them. But essentially, um, we, we we wanted to be able to uh, solve that problem. And I mean, on the surface, th these ones were actually mostly fine. You just need a null check when you iterate. But um, the compiler actually, um, actually, um, and actually, I'm going to go to solid now for this one. The compiler for uh, for components actually uh, uses a, a helper that we have in solid um, under solid source render components, something called merge props. And I, let's see if I can get to our next branch. Um, It wasn't too bad, but um, yeah, uh, it's fine. We, we just went in and do now like these hidden null checks inside that. I, this one isn't actually that interesting. It's just, I, I, I thought the solution is not interesting. I think the problem is a little bit interesting though. Like um, in any case it's solved. I, I just wanted to show that one just because it was like, a, you know, th these kind of things, you know and the way they work with the compiler and it's like made me want to finally cut a release. Um, this last issue actually has to do with stores, and we're going to talk about stores in a minute. But um, I think before we get to stores, I want to talk about the other big part of this release, and that is resources. A lot of thought, because I've been working on Solid Start, has gone into resources. And I'm, I'm going to just go to the next branch here and see if I can pull up the change log. I got two really cool features I want to show you about resources tonight. And um, the first one, is something that I call resource deferred streaming. Um, essentially, we, we've been hitting this problem. We introduced streaming in 1.3 and people have been playing with it and it's really cool. But sometimes the problem, the challenge with streaming is once you start the response, you have to send the headers and the status code and you, you no longer get to say like it's a 404 or it's an error. So sometimes there's some data fetching that you wanna do before you start the stream, you're just like, okay, it's fine. You're like, I'm streaming, you know, I'm in, but like, I want to know the users at least logged in first, right? I don't have to fetch all the data maybe, but you know, but I need to at least do one thing. And there's a solution to that, right? You can always just do the request before you call the render function. In fact, we saw it right here, right? This doesn't have to be render stream. This can be render to stream here. We can just run some stuff. I'm not saying the loaders, but we can always like block it and then start. As we mentioned before, maybe not the best idea, um, but it's something you can do. The thing is when you build a meta framework like solid start and you're trying to like wrap all these things into like nicer bundles, you don't want people really like messing, like they can, but you don't want like to be like, oh, the answer to your problem for this very common thing is to just go in and change the root file, you know, where we've pre-configured everything for you. You know, you, you don't want that to be the, the pattern. And, and like, essentially, I, I was like, I was like, how do I solve this? And, you know, I was thinking, okay, maybe I can hold suspense boundaries and stuff. But the answer is actually, you know, much simpler. And I, I can't, came up with this a couple months ago, but I, like, it's been taking me forever to get here. Like, what if we just say, hey, I, I just want this resource to wait. So, I'm going to pull up an example here, and I used this example a lot previously, but I, you know it's not Hacker News. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to pull up. I've got Solid here in the, in the repo. Um, let's let's make it a little bigger so you guys can all see. And I've got this uh, this this example that I like to use, and I'm going to um, build the streaming version of this example. And 
It's the, it's the example SSR example I have inside the solid repo. Um, and it, I think it serves on 8080, but I didn't start the server. Sorry, my bad. You, you can run these learner commands. I know learner is dead, but whatever. Or someone picked it up. But essentially, the, the, these examples show async, streaming, all the different stuff. So, OK, I'm going to go to the profile page. OK, and the way this profile page works is it loads a John profile, and then it loads the information about John. So we actually, we have console logs um, in this data fetch, and I can show it here. I'll pull up the code example. Let's let's give ourselves a little bit more window room here. Maybe, no, apparently not. This is why I hate pulling up the window. Um, we have this kind of like data loading function where we create two resources and we console log in the first one, load users, and then the other one, we console log load info. And essentially they feed into each other, they're cascading. Like you could do this across loaders or whatever, but essentially there's a user and that user is the source for the second resource. The first resource has no source and it just loads and the second one feeds in. So initially when it runs, this is undefined, so it doesn't run it. So it actually cascades, it loads the user and then presumably you know, uses that information to load this more information about the user. That, that's essentially what we're simulating here in this example. And um, what it happens is when we load our page, we see that there's this double loader cascade where it goes loading and then loading, right? And obviously if I had better placeholders and stuff, we could do better things that don't cause layout shifts. But what I wanted to show is you can kind of see the first data loads and the second, then the second later data loads. In fact, you know what? Let's make this more visual because we're on stream and you guys might not see that. Let's uh, up this to a second each um, to make it less realistic per se. But let's let's do let's do this to be visual, okay? So I'm going to try it again. Loading, loading, okay? And what you'll see here is those two calls are called on the server, and in our console here they're not called. Sure, if we leave and we come back, we're going to see one and two. You're seeing an async transition there, a suspense, um, which is why it held. But um, essentially, we'll talk about those more later. One, two. Now, what if that first user information is important enough that you don't want to kind of like go through that loading state and you, you say like there's no point showing the page or maybe you need to do auth or something, right? All I'm saying is take your resource and just go defer stream. And we, we, we so just taking our existing code, build it again. Start. And now when we do it, we don't see that first load. It does take a longer to use the load because it takes a second. But what you're seeing here is the page actually loads with the first section and then only streams the, the remainder. Um, and in fact, if we wanted to, we could probably defer stream true whole thing. This was what we were into. And essentially, now this is, I mean, you're not going to see it loaded. This is the same as async rendering in, in solid. It's streaming, but we, we have control at a resource level, um, essentially, this loading behavior. So, and what's cool about it is if I go back to the original version, cut back. What you'll see if I if we look at the uh, network tab, I'll kind of pull it out and view this. You'll see header content of the page. You see some scripts for hydration setting up. We'll see some initialization scripts. This is how it knows to wait. Like if you don't have these scripts, Solid will like client render. Like it kind of falls back that way. And then you'll see the initial part of the content of the page, the which is the um, nav right here. And then you'll see a placeholder loading for the first one. And then if you go down further, you'll see this hidden section, which where we swap in the John's thing and this section could be about you with the second loading indicator. And then some scripts that actually set the data and move the, the, this hidden content into place. And then further down, we'll see the, the second section with all this information 
th the thing that passes the serialized data and then the, the one that the, the calling the same function again that moves that hidden content into place so that we get our final um, results. And what's cool about this is if we add the, the first stream, I'll, uh, you know, like I just did, So now we're just now we're just uh, we're we're gonna wait for the first one and not the second one. So we do this one. So see so now and that and stream out the second one. This is resource level two. The, the reason they're holding is each suspense boundary reads from a separate resource. So like it, it goes ping ping. But if they both listen to one or something like, it, it's based on the resource, not on the suspense boundary. Um, what you'll see here is now our initialization script has a bit more stuff in it. It actually has the first data. And if we look in here, the first flush actually has John's profile in with the loader. And now we only have a single section for doing the second replacement and, and moving it up. And as you can imagine, if we go all the way and do this, we reload the page, no, no loading indicator and Everything is serialized in the header. Everything renders in place, and there's no additional script tags. So this is basically async rendering. It's all this. This work is kind of like um, getting us to a point where async and streaming are essentially the same thing. Um, they already kind of were, but um, this work helped uh, consolidate this um, because when I first made this improvement. I wasn't actually compressing it back up. I, you, it would still move into place, even though it would wait to flush it. It would still move into place. But now we actually um, put it in. So it, it basically, um, you, you don't do extra work in the browser if you don't need to, essentially, is, is the way this works. Um, so yeah, question. Yo, the thing is, it, it, this doesn't block anything. It, um, it, it's It's kind of like, like um, Mike Scaladrop. The reason I showed you guys this whole thing was these all run in parallel and they finish as they finish. All we're doing here is instead of st streaming the response shell here, essentially, instead of doing this, we just took this line, number five, and we moved it under six. Essentially. Like, it's, it's all non-blocking. If we tell one resource to defer the stream, it still loads and does all its normal suspensing. It doesn't affect the way the execution happens on the server. It doesn't make it any more blocking. Um, we're not using like async awaiting going, you can't pass. Um, instead, we're just we're just holding the we're just holding the queue at the front. It's like the, the bouncer who's like, you know, letting you in. in. They're, they're just like, okay, now you go. Now you go. We're just like, okay, we're gonna hold it a little longer. If you wait until render string, there'll be no parallel requests. Well, well, no. I mean, the thing is, how should I how should I put it? Um, none of this is blocking. So, like, like if even if I move it all the way to the bottom. Uh, yes, the server doesn't get or doesn't send it to the client, but it, it, it doesn't change the fact that we were preemptively running. It's like it, it, this is even if we render at the end here, it is different than this because this literally didn't do any rendering until all the data was loading. This was rendering while we were loading. It just chose not to send it to the end. And the benefit of that, obviously, is if, if you do need to know, like you don't want this page to stream, like you do need to, for some reason, I said, you're trying to avoid these patterns, but if you do need to like load all the data, um, because you haven't sent the response yet, you do have the ability to do a redirect or a 404. See the way solid start handles this with streaming is if you've already flushed the outer shell and you get an error or redirect, well, we just go, okay, server stops where it is sends it through the stream and the client actually handles the redirect or the error um, the way it would once it's hydrated and because it is hydrated because while you're streaming the outer sh like the, the layers that send in can start hydrating before the stream's finished so you have an interactive page while the stream's coming in so 
so um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of an interesting um, scenario here because uh, essentially, if you embrace streaming completely, um, the out of order streaming, you can handle these cases in the client because, like, if if you had, it's it's kind of it is a hybrid. Like, you can always do a redirect or handle an error in the client, um, and the server can error and throw the error across the network. Um, so, like that, but in some cases, you know, maybe just like the first request, you just know, like, I always have to check if the person's logged in. You can hold the stream for, you know, maybe it's in Redis, maybe it's like a six or 10 millisecond hit. You, you can, you can, you can hold the stream and not send it right away. In fact, you could hold rendering and not send it right away. But in our case, you don't have to make that sacrifice. You can literally just go out to Redis async, keep on rendering, and then, you know, when Redis goes, oh yeah, yeah, the person is logged in, then you can just, you know, send whatever you have at that point. So it is non-blocking. There is a huge, there is a difference between these two is what I'm trying to get get at. Okay. So so I think this is a really cool feature. Um, again, it's super easy to use because essentially like all you have to do, just go like defer this. You know, just for the further stream. I, I'm still playing around with the names. I don't know. If, I was saying wait before, but it's not actually wait. Um, so yeah, I, I think let's wait. I was trying to wait before. We we can you know bike shed APIs all we want, but you, you kind of get get the gist of it here. It's essentially you just mark any resource, any suspense boundary that depends on that resource. Um, obviously, can't uh, flush. And if if you wait for that resource and the suspense boundary happens to be able to flush at that time, you can skip doing the um, kind of load in um, fallback state in the client. That's that's just, it's, it's a smooth transition from it. Well, I think this was actually kind of fun because it wasn't too hard. Um, I'm going to see if I can pull, pull up um, our, our DOM expressions again here because uh, it's, uh, do, 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 do. maybe I don't, yeah, okay. Because essentially, um, I'm just going to show this here, server.js. We already have this mechanism for writing resources. We have to serialize them. We have to send those data. You saw there's the initial call and then when I set the data. Um, so the, the answer was actually really, 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 really stupidly simple. As long as we keep track of if we first flushed or not, Essentially, I made a variable for it up here for first, first flush. As long as we keep track that we we flushed, um, all we have to do is when we um, where is it here? Write a resource. We check and we go if it's set that you know to defer the stream or wait or whatever, and it's not flushed yet. Push the promise into an array. See, because generally we have to listen to this promise anyways. Because when it's completed, we have to serialize the data or serialize the error. So we already have the promise. Every um, resource registers itself while suspense is running so that we can serialize it. So at that point, I was just like, okay, if you know that it has the defer stream option, push into a list. And then when you call pipe later on here, when we pass back like the pipe APIs, we just go promise settle all blocking resources and basically done. Um, like this, this took me like 20 minutes to do the basic implementation of um, because essentially you, you just, you just hold it on those promises um, and you, you know, there you go. Yeah, I think this is a super powerful feature. Um, it just, it, and it's very easy API to use and it lets you kind of scale. Like I, there's always this concern when you streaming because of the status that you can't do all the use cases and you have to like kind of fight with it. With an API like this where you don't have to think about it, um, the end user can just choose. And um, I think I'm really excited about this one. The other really cool thing we did with resources was um, another kind of tricky pattern um, that, that, I've, that I've been seeing. And that pattern is, I'm actually gonna pull up a code sandbox to show, to show this demo, I think. Um, and I think the demo that I wanna show is called stale resource, yeah. Okay, I'm going to fork this so that I don't mess with my copy of it. But we've we've been kind of um, 
we've been kind of playing around a bit with suspense and resources here. And yeah, let me picture, I'm gonna, I'm gonna strip everything out at first to kind of make it easier. Um, but essentially picture you have a button where when you click on it, it cycles through a bunch of users. And I'm actually going to pull out even these suspense boundaries and I'm going to I'll leave some of this stuff in, but it probably won't make a ton of sense to everyone. Okay, I'm gonna pull out these suspense boundaries and show the most basic, basic case. Um, I pulled up too much. All right, I, I, it's because I, I need to replace this with a fragment, my bad. So let's do this, okay. So if you have solid, and I'm just using a resource, it could be a signal, whatever. And essentially, if you, if you, we've got this cascading thing where we have a details and we have a, a profile timeline, let's call it, uh, these two things. And they listen, one listens to the, looks to the user and the other thing looks at their list of posts, okay? And essentially um, the, po the, the timeline or the posts is just like a for loop. Now, I've got like a mock API here as well, and it's it's just creating a few resources and a way of triggering them. There's a, the set, which changes the ID, so to speak, which triggers the next resource. And this get ID is just a matter of like saying what the next resource in, is, in, is in this. And let me see, I don't actually even expose the, uh, the, the, the uh, ID. Um, it's kind of wrapped in here. It doesn't really matter a ton. But what actually, you know what? It does matter. I'm gonna I'm gonna expose it here. Let's call it um, ID, and we'll, we'll make s. I'm doing wrong. Um, oh, it's an array. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. This is like not uh, ID. So essentially just made a small tweak to this and actually I'm not even on the latest, am I? It doesn't really matter. I guess this stuff is still good. Okay. 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 Yep. This is actually probably a mistake. I'm trying to get the new version. Code Sandbox is probably going to be like, I don't know what version this is. Okay, okay. So if you don't have any suspense and you load this thing, what ends up happening is you see this kind of, you have no loading indicator and then this loads and then this loads, right? You kind of see this thing. And then um, we're going to actually grab resource.s and I'm, I'm going to stick it in here um, just as like an extra indicator of where we're at. I'm going to add like a span maybe. And because the original example didn't have this, let's let's go. What is it? Uh, resource dot ID. I think I called it. Okay, so ID zero, right? And then when I click next, you're gonna see ID one. Actually, let's let's do something like H three. Okay, there we go. This isn't the prettiest, but it should serve. So you see zero. I click next, it immediately changes to one. Then this loads, then this loads. This is what happens when you have no suspense or transitions or anything on a page. So initially loads, one, two, three, waterfall, this, 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 one, two, three, okay. Now, um, the thing is, some people, you could handle loading state yourself, but one really nice, cool thing you can do is add suspense. So um, it's funny, I'm actually gonna, I'm too lazy. I'm actually gonna pull the, the original um, version back so that I can just copy the suspense stuff over again. 
so that I don't have to worry about it. Um, so let's let's grab it. So a lot of people get this far because they're, they're they're working on on uh, solid and they're like, okay, cool, I, I need suspense. So they might add one suspense boundary around this thing, and they're like, okay, sweet. So you get this like loading, and then this happens. And when you go to the next page, you get loading, and this happens. Well, it's cool. You see the number and the loading happens at the same time, right? Here you go. Welcome to suspense. Our our problems have been solved. This this is this is what you get when you use suspense in Preact, and when you use it in uh, Vue. Okay, sweet. Suspense is awesome. No, this is kind of garbage. I mean, it's okay, but it, this is not great. Like the first thing, and it, you, is you might be like, well, I don't actually care about these details. I want to actually defer this a bit. I mean, this this loading state's better now. I know the stuff's loading, but you know, maybe I don't need to wait for everything. Maybe I'm okay, like getting the the top level stuff, and this can load later. So. Then you add, well, cool thing is you can just add a second suspense boundary. So you can isolate it with suspense. Okay. So let's, I'm going to shrink this so that we can get more visibility on here on the code. Let's, let's add our second suspense boundary around here. And now we're cooking. Okay. So sweet. Now, now, now that's a little better. It loads and loads. I mean, you pretend it's not just a header, pretend you have content. So like you actually see the, you don't have to wait. And this is very much like we were talking about with the streaming APIs. Like maybe you actually, this is so important that you actually wait on the server and only stream the second part or whatever, right? And when you click next, well, the same thing happens as you get around. And as it, this is really jarring because it's like what it is. This might be slightly better, but it's also kind of worse because the other one, at least you just loaded the whole thing at once. So you're kind of like, oh, like maybe if this stuff's like below the fold or lower down, you don't mind this kind of thing. Like pretend this is a long post and these are the comments. Like it's okay, but this is still really jarring navigation, but it is improved over our original nothing version because our nothing version was one, two, three. Like you saw this number update and then this, then this updated, and this updated. So like this would show like two um, when it was still showing the old version. You know what I mean? Like you go next and you see three, and then it would be showing two the thing from two, and then that would load and that load. Like it, it was this really awkward thing where you, you weren't seeing consistent state. Now at least, since we had a suspense, it's consistent. We can see that it's one, and we're going to see the stuff for two or whenever it gets in. But yeah, jarring, jarring. So um, we have we have a solution to that problem, and that solution is transitions. And transitions are great because essentially um, they allow us to not fall back to that skeleton state, right? So when you first load, you don't have anything, so you're like, okay, cool, I'm loading. But then when you go to the next one, it kind of tells you it's loading. And like you can use gray out or whatever. And this this styling's bad because I, I changed it in such a way that it's part of the layout shift. Like maybe maybe we sh we actually want to move this loading indicator into our header or something just so it doesn't do that as badly. Let's let's do this. So here we go. So yeah. Now instead of showing the fallback. When we press the button, we still see zero, but we see it's loading and then it's consistent. So this we this isn't this is kind of like back to when we had the single suspense boundary um, where you know we waited and then we showed. And the thing is, this is less jarring than falling back to those skeletons for most people. Okay. But this still might not be preferable because yeah, sure, initial loading, we can handle placeholders, but you might be like, you know what? This stuff just isn't very important. I don't want to, to, to just wait for it. Like I, I want this first. We already, that's where we split the suspense. I don't really care about this stuff. It can be out of date. I just need a way of indicating it. So React has something called create deferred value. But I was like, 
I, I, it was a weird API where you had like compare like stuff and I, I didn't like it. So I, I was like, what if you, there was a way that you could listen to the latest value of, of a route uh, or sort of a resource without it triggering suspense? What could you do with that? Well, there's a lot of things. Like there's a lot of things that the, the first time they load, that's all you care. Like you, you like if you if you're wiring observable into this into like a resource, and it has like a bunch of like steps that shoot. You don't you you only really need the skeleton state the first time. You don't want to like fall back to it. So even if we're like forgetting about transitions for a second, using using um, something which doesn't trigger suspense might be valuable. In fact, latest actually when it realizes it's never had a value, it does trigger suspense. But if it if it's ever had a value, then it goes, okay, I'll just show you the latest value instead. So when you load the page here with latest, what you're seeing is still the double suspense triggering. But when you go to the next page, I'm actually gonna comment this out for a second because I'm gonna explain that. When you go to the next page, watch it, it loads holding this. And then as soon as George loads, it actually updates the number in George, but it keeps this in the past because we don't care about that. And then eventually shows it. So let's watch it again, loading. See this. So these two change together. So it does wait to show the tab change until the data is loaded. Like it finishes the outer suspense, but in here it never tracks the inner suspense. So it thinks it's done. And then this updates when latest does, and it's completely independent of suspense. Bang. So you're like, ah, uh, but I mean, the only problem with that is it's, you don't know this is out of date. Like what if this takes a while? Like you don't know it's out of date. But what the, this is actually a really cool trick. You know when the resource is loading and bec because it gets held under suspense, the loading state won't show until, um, or sorry, under transition, the loading state won't show until, until the transition's done. So we can actually gray this out here as we navigate once it, once it's stale. When it's consistent, we're fine. But the second that this loads and this is out of date, we'll make this a different color, slightly gray. I don't know if you guys can see this on, on stream, but see? So yeah, maybe it took a bit to get, get up to this example, but what I'm trying to show off here, and there's a lot of applications of being able to get, grab this latest value um, once you have it without triggering suspense, but essentially we have now a third mode, essentially. Um, I guess it's fourth if you count no suspense, but you have the ability to um, you know, not use suspense, obviously, and show everything kind of torn. You have the ability to use suspense and force everything into placeholder state, you can use transitions to stop falling back to placeholders after the fact. And now with the use of latest, you have the ability to selectively opt things out of, um, out of suspense. So you can have partial tearing if it makes sense for your application. And as this is probably a bit of an edge case, but there's other cases where you're just like, I only care about suspense the first time and I don't want to worry about it. Like, like the thing about this is, you can remove this transition here now, essentially, with this this with this move, I believe. I mean, we can find out. And oh right, yeah, we can't see it because the outer resource. Okay, let's pretend we really didn't care. Let's let's change this to latest. Now neither of them are tracking. They initially have the loading state. When I click next. I mean, it's, I'm opting into tearing for both of them. But we're not, we, we aren't f falling back to suspense, even though we don't have a transition. I'm not saying that this is the best UI. Um, like this, you see what happens now when we click next, this updates immediately again, like the original example. So there, there is this tearing. Um, but my, my point is, you, there, there is now a mechanism for this. Well, whether you, you know, this is probably one that you know only certain people are going to find a use for, but the fact that it exists is a very powerful third mode. Okay. So that's sort of the conversation on resources. I think this stuff's super powerful, both between the the streaming holding APIs, and yes, I, I think this is the might be 
one of the first SSR specific ones on one of the like reactive primitives. Um, we do have some specific uh, components, um, assets and no hydration that have kind of SSR wear, but in terms of uh, uh, like um, a specific um, piece, it's mostly because our primitives are actually fairly simplistic. If you think about it, they don't have very many options. Um, create resource might have the most options, um, but it's super powerful because people wrap it when people make like our solid query wrapper, they use resources under the hood and they get the ability to opt into these, these abilities themselves um, quite easily. Um, you know, they can add their caching layer, do all that kind of stuff and still have the ability to kind of control it. Like some people are like, oh, we should have like a turn suspense on and off um, kind of toggle on the resource. And I'm like, no, no, it's not about the fetching. It's about the reading. You don't want to show inconsistency. Like, like latest, if you have never loaded a value, latest will still trigger suspense that first time. If you really never, ever want to trigger suspense, well, just give the resource initial value. Um, resources have an initial value field. If you set the initial value, then it'll, then it'll go, it'll satisfy that. The, the resource will be like, oh, okay, I have initial value. Um, I know that I don't need to, um, you know, suspend that first time. So, um, you know, this, this is a very powerful, versatile API. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. There hasn't been much questions or conversation about this, this part of the demonstration. So um, it's been pretty quiet the last few minutes, but um, let's move on to the, to the next one here. Um, and that next one is, um, we we'll talk about stores. Um, Go into here. Wait a second. I, sorry, I just like comes up with something. De develop it, just start Jotai. Hmm. This is, that's Jason Miller, uh, creator of Preact. Wonder what he's working on. Okay. Um, let's go to next and look at our change log again. It's a couple things I've been doing with stores. I'm actually. This might be the best feature of the whole release. Maybe I've been holding the, the thing. You know what? I, I almost don't want to ruin it. I, I want to go. I want to go straight to Code Sandbox and and show you um, how awesome it is. Sorry, I, actually, you know what? I got ahead of myself. I didn't actually show you guys how I implemented that resource thing. Sorry, it takes it take me two seconds because once I realized that I could use loading for the lazy state, the implementation for the, this is so simple. Um, you know, sometimes the, the hard problem is actually finding the, the, like figuring out what the solution should be rather than the problem. Check this out. Latest is a getter that if it's ever been, if it hasn't been resolved before called read, which is like our, like our normal accessor, like on the resource, like the expensive one that triggers suspense. Otherwise, if there's an error, throw an error. Otherwise just return the value. And what value is, is the underlying signal that's under the resource. Like at the, uh, basically there's a signal that drives the resource, it's the internal storage. I just expo expose the in internal storage instead of wrapping it in our um, like read thing that triggers suspense. So like this, this one also was surprisingly simple. It was just a matter of wrapping, <laughs> writing this getter um, to, to, to get it to work. Anyway, sorry, um, let's, 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 let's talk stores um so i'm gonna i'm gonna pull up a demo you guys have probably seen before solid simple to do's and so i've already forked it but i'm going to do this again from scratch and we are going to fork it again i have like so many copies of these now okay solid simple to do's okay so this is a simple to-do example. It's not even to-do MVC, although it's very similar. It has like the local storage synchronization. And we're going to uh, you know, bump this up. In fact, I think we can bump this all the way up. It doesn't really matter, okay. So what is this example? Well, we have our local storage store, which it doesn't really matter for the case of this, but essentially it just creates a store. And then it has a to-dos list and a title. And 
we you know do some operations here when we add it to do uh, uh, you can do some operations like change update the to do remove the to do from the list etc okay no, no, nothing too crazy here but the thing is there's there's always this like big shift when you go between like the signal version and the the store version i mean if you've been to solidjs.com and use the tutorials you know what i'm talking about there's there's that that tutorial where we introduce stores for the first time somewhere near the end and we're like i i actually bother showing what nest reactivity but let, let's look at create store because you start with a signal and your signal was to do's set to do's here's the array and then you have to do like all these immutable operations to kind of do the operations so you know I mean, it, this is basically the same example, right? Ta -da. And the point of this exercise, if I remember correctly, is every time you change this, it's triggering. And the reason it's triggering is because we're recloning the whole item. The, the, you can solve it. See, it's funny. This tutorial, A, isn't telling you to use nested reactivity because it's like a... Uh, a good thing that I, because it's like a solution we provide is just showing like the, the natural way to solve this is by nesting signals so you don't recreate full objects. But the, the problem is when you go, okay, screw this, I want to use the built like the good solution, and you switch it to go solve it and you use a store, suddenly it becomes store set store, which has a to do's object on it, and everything's been kind of pushed down and now you your APIs and all this stuff. And now you you have a store thing. So even though it works the same and it solves our problem, you know, you you kind of feel invested in it. Like, yes, this won't trigger again when you're using the store because it's using nested reactivity. Now, the thing is, you know, this, this is all fine and it works and there's a good reason for it. Reactivity is based on property access. And, you know, if you don't track it, you can't run it. But this has been bugging me because what I really want to do here is I kind of want to, you know, I'm going to pull create signal in, in here. But what, what, what I want to do is I want to, you know, like sure this store is kind of cool and I made everything to store state. And for a while I thought this is how people would use solid. You know, what? actually I'm going to get rid of this local storage thing because it's just, it's just noise. What, but what I kind of want to do here is I actually, this, pulling everything in the store doesn't really feel like idiot, um, idiomatic solid anymore. It feels more like we should have like, you know, a new title and, you know, people using React um, are, are kind of more accustomed to, you know, making everything these separate things. When I created the original store API, um, I was, it was during, and signal API, it, but, but most important story API, it was during when React sold classes. And I thought people would want to use plain objects the way they use um, like state, state and set state in React class components. And that's why it used to be called create state in fact, which is even more confusing with it being different than use state. But essentially, um, sorry, I imported it from the wrong place. That's, that's essentially, um, I thought people would just put everything in an object like I just did here. But the truth of the matter is that's not really what you want to do. It feels like this should actually be its own thing. It, I, the only reason I put this in was because it kind of felt like, well, if I already had a store, I might as well just put everything in the store, right? It, 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 because like, it, it didn't feel like it's natural upgrade. But we can we can change new title to, to, to be like this, right? And, and it's, it's kind of more explicit too. It's a set state. You can just go like set new title to this, right? Like I'm actually, this is, this is actually reducing the code a little bit. I mean, sure, this one, this one might not reduce the code, but you remove that one line and okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm like the guy who's like cheating everything here, but, and replaces it with set new title. So, I mean, arguably this is, a little bit worse, but I think everywhere else is fine. Okay, yeah. So now this should work, and now 
Thank you, Code Sandbox. The only reason I'm not using the playground is because I'm using experimental versions of uh, experimental but beta versions of solid. Okay, yeah, I'm not doing this right because I'm not reading from the store in the right place. I missed this one. Um, but essentially, you know, unsurprisingly, like this. But the, 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 the problem is this you know, store to do's. What I really want is to just go create to do's, right? I, I, like, think about how much nicer this would be if I could just go to do's, set to do's, right? Um, Cause then all this garbage goes away. You don't like set on the object. You're just like, okay, I wanna just set the new to do's. You know, I could just do that maybe. In fact, no, I mean, that's not bad. I mean, maybe, or even just do like, you know, me and my single letters, but maybe just pass in the previous state like this kind of deal, like whatever suits your, suits your, your, your style and, oh, sorry, set to do's. This, this isn't any more readable right, for the matter. And instead of like that, I just kind of want to just, do that. And I don't want to like get rid of these string paths. I just want to kind of just do this, do this here. We can use the T here and get all rid of all these. We, we kind of just want to be able to, and oh, that compresses a lot. So nice. Um, it's kind of like, it, it's nicer because you can say what the thing is. You're like, these are just to do's. And you're setting the to-dos. There's no like set state and dot this and having all this intermediate stuff. And then you want to be able to just type here and have it just work. Um, and the thing is, this has never worked in solid before, unfortunately, because of this property access thing. And I, I had enough of it. So um, coming with solid 1.4, we finally have top level arrays um, in stores, which I think is a huge um, boon for teaching and explaining because remember that poor tutorial that we were looking at where you went from signal to store? Well, now you literally just change, you keep the variables the same. You just change this from create signal to create store. And um, like, especially if you're using, you were using the functional form, um, you, you might even be able to keep most of the same code. Yeah, so this one's funny because I'm making a big deal out of it. The reason this didn't work before was because of this sucker right here. This isn't reactive. And I think I need to explain a bit about how stores work to understand the, the problem here. Um, but yeah, th this one isn't reactive. Um, and there is a solution to this problem, but I didn't really want to make specialized array types and stuff. Um, and it's, it's a little bit tricky because there's, there's, two, there's two problems. Like, because you can conceptually look at this and go, well, if this is, who cares if it's not reactive? If this is a for loop, it's going to access each key. Um, so shouldn't it just track the keys and it should track the length too. So if the length changes or any of the keys change, then it should update. So this is why I finally moved this way. Cause like conceptually it made sense. The only reason that it wasn't, um, working was because I'm, uh, I'm so big on performance. It would be incredibly, think about it. If you change an array, you have to diff it or reconcile it. There's, there's no escaping that reality um, because you need to like, I mean, there are some ways, but they're, 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 they're complicated. But generally speaking, it's the one place where diffing exists in svelte or solid or whatever, right? I mean, I guess technically there's a couple other smaller places. I shouldn't include svelte in that because svelte actually does a security check thing. But, okay, but, like, but generally like this is the guarantee place for most frameworks where they still do diffing. and. The thing is, if you know that any change of the array is always going to change the array, 
you, there's no point tracking every key separately. So if you ever look um, at Solid and look at the map array implementation, well, in fact, no, sorry, not attack uh, We can look at it right now. We have it in front of us. Map array, which is our un underlying function underneath four, it, it sets up some stuff up and then returns a function, which isn't that important, uh, um, which is our memo, which is our thing where it reads the list, right? And then the first thing it does is call on track. <laughs> and why does it call on track? Because I don't want to track every single index. And, and, and you know, if your list is 10,000 items long, I don't want to track 10,000 indexes and check all of those. If you change or move one item in the list, I'm going to reconcile the whole thing anyways. Like, I mean, I realize you, that might seem inefficient, but the reconciliation code has to be there anyways um, because of like arbitrary list dumps. Like you might th be think, well, if you just swap an item, you could just swap it in the DOM and like be fully reactive. But it goes out the window when pe like people start like like random sorting, jumping stuff at you. You know, especially with batched way. Like you could you could do a random sort as a series of individual moves, but applying it in a batch where order matters, like the complexity there of keeping that in check and applying it simultaneously um, is no less complicated than diffing. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I work on benchmarks that do crazy stuff like that, spams, like snapshots, like dbmon or um, UI bench. And yeah, it was just like, just diff, right? Sometimes diffing is the, is the right solution. You know, people overcritically in the VDOM, they shouldn't be like, they're, 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 there's a time and a place. Hey, Ryan, some people are catching in now, right? So what, so the, the, the trick here is I untrack everything so it didn't work because I only want to track the list, this one thing. And you're like, well, how does that work? Well, it comes down to how, the way the stores work. And um, we'll, can we save this? No, I don't want to save image. I'll just save this to my computer. Export, save to disk. Um, what do I call this one? Um, parallel. Okay, cool. Let's save that. Okay. Now we're just going to clear this and start over again. It's because, okay, when you got a proxy, let's say, and I'm going to draw proxy as a node. Okay. You've got proxy. You can pretend this is like, um, I guess we, we want something that has a list. So this is going to be our store. And then. Our store is going to have a few users. Three right. users in our list. Um, it doesn't really matter what these are, honestly. And our users are going to have some properties this. I mean, it looks like a reactive graph, but it's actually not exactly. Um, so our user has some properties. Okay. Now, the thing is, the store itself doesn't track. It's the property axis. So um, uh, let's make this index zero, index one, index two, first name, and last name, okay, right? But what I'm trying to get at here is, is that essentially when, when we have this kind of like set up, you can access the you can access the property obviously, and each one of these will need a a signal underneath it somewhere. And then you know, assuming this is an object, we wrap it in another proxy, and it's just ducks all the way down essentially um, until well, this one first name and last name are primitive values, so you can't wrap them, right? Um, so they're they're just strings, but essentially. Each one of these 
holds the signals for its its children essentially right based on what key they're at so the top level store has three signals this one each of these has two additional signals potentially in in solid we actually create the signals lazily only if you're listening but which which is an important fact here because I was trying with proxies to figure out how I could have them be as super, super performant, essentially. Um, and it was a tricky, it was a tricky move. And what I realized with my little trick of only listening is it's possible to not have a signal, um, like only have the signal for the array and not for the others. Now, as you can understand, there's a problem here for with with um, generally speaking, and solid, solid stores have always had this, is how do you trigger yourself essentially, right? Because I, I told you that this has three children on it. And now we're saying that there's potentially another signal for for, for yourself. And what, the, what we did with solid is, we did it in two ways. Whenever you, access um any property um so so let's let's call it data access whenever you are yeah act, state access or store access whenever you access a property we would we'd essentially you you have the the proxy and you have the key that's the way that it works so you would go track property and then what i would do is I would actually walk into th this, and if this has a self, which not everything did essentially, um, track properties self. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, on the other hand, when when you write access, or I guess write. Essentially, usually you just essentially like you're, you'd say I'm writing to this property. So I'm like replacing index zero. You generally would just set property signal. However, I said that if it was an array, I'd also set self. But this, this is basically how, how, how we did this, um, this, this approach. Um, and we only basically only if it existed, because we here when I say track property, it's like it's actually and create if not existing, and this 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 is basically was the the whole um, I guess this one and create. Uh, Yeah. So essentially, if you wrote to something and sorry, set self, I should say, if array set self, it was actually two things. It's actually if array and or new property or new delete property. Essentially, on objects too, we would trigger it if it was a new or um, deleted property. Because if you iterate over objects, you, uh, you basically had no way of knowing um, if, if uh, yeah, you basically had no way of knowing if if something new was added. Because yeah, you sure, if it's an object, you, you track and walk over the keys. But if someone adds a different key, like let's say we added middle name, no, there's you, you never track middle name, so you would never know and you never iterate. So um, I made it that whenever a new or delete happened, we actually triggered the the, the, the self, which if you saw during this, the track, when you accessed zero, it actually tracks this one and the self of this one. So essentially it would overlap. Um, so as so writing a new um, writing to a, a new property to, to this user would actually, trigger this, which would actually cause the, 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 like the array or the top level object to run. And 
this works pretty good. And this is what we were doing in solid for the longest time. But um, the top level one could never play this game because it could, there was no way for it ever to trigger itself. That, that was basically the, the, the whole problem because you just pass it in and there's no, there's no self trigger. Um, and I, I, I kind of didn't want there to be, cause I was like, oh, that's weird because like, sure I could expose it, but then like someone like would have to know how to do it. And then I realized recently that I was just being really dumb because the truth of the matter is the only reason we hit a problem is because of the optimization. If someone just goes right to for loop, they're going to hit all of these in the length and they're going to track them and it's going to work. The only reason you need to track self here is because I untrack all these accesses. So yeah, I, I realized I was being dumb. So, but there's a, there's a problem here. The top level arrays are, are really cool, but the, the problem, and you, you may have seen this in solid before. Um, so not many people have seen this before, but if I go const uh, store, set store, and I go um, create store, um, let's go to do's because that's, that's the game today. And put something in um, title hi. Um, um, what's what's the other one? Um, done. Import this. If, if I went and did this, right, and and then made effect, essentially, console.log um, store zero dot done. Let's say we just care if that's time to make, uh, import that. Import create effect. Um, you guys are like, where's the render in the reactive root? Um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I, I actually probably should be adding that. I should uh, update it. New thing in solid uh, uh, 1.4 is create effects aren't, I, I, I batch them to the micro task queue top level because I thought it made sense, but no longer. They'll just run uh, immediately like a create root would. It's more consistent. So that's another change in coming in 1.4. But my, what, where I was getting at here is that um, if, if, okay, so why is this not, yeah, let's just, uh, let's just grab our, our example and pull it into like a new playground. Let's go playground. Move this up here. This is just my lazy way of, of um, that was a prettier format document, of um, getting a root in. I, I, I didn't need to do this, obviously. Okay, so what am I doing wrong? Because this is strangely weird that we're not getting it printing at least once. Is it, is it, is it not? interesting i'm like this is like you've been going for a while and you're just like oh see i'm already used to top level arrays i didn't even see what i was doing probably that might have been it no that's not it what am i doing wrong do, 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 do. <laughs> you're right i forgot to import render <laughs> oh man import render um Yes. The funny thing is, that, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. you. You guys in the chat are quicker than me. Yes, right. But what I, what I wanted to show everyone was that if I uh, set, I, didn't, I guess I didn't need the component because I need to set a timeout for this anyways. If I set timeout um, to a second and then set store 
and went to do's one. Um, added something here. Title two or something. Okay. What I, what I wanted to show is this kind of sucks. It's it, we're only listening to one, or sorry, we're only listening to zero. And when we set one, it's the new property rule. So this, this method works most of the time, but I was kind of over subscribing and I was also didn't like the fact that I, I couldn't expose this stuff. So I figured, it's funny, there was a discussion on Discord and it realized and I realized there's actually a really, really, really simple solution to, to all my problems, which is that we were already doing this double thing, but what if we just change the rules a bit? What if we always set self? Okay, but remember it only creates it here. We put the condition here. If um, if, if something special, essentially, not you don't always track it, and that's if something special. It turns out. We, we can basically only choose to track self or create the self if we're doing iteration. Okay. So let me, let me go into to, to the store implementation, show you what I'm talking about. Essentially, let's go here, own keys, track self. Um, own keys essentially creates this. Let's see, is track self called anywhere else? Where is track self called? Actually, let me I just want to, I think there might be a second place, track self. Two places. Own keys, which you trigger when you go like um, object.keys or, you know, that kind of thing, can, can track self, right? And the other place that can track self, um, essentially, is I added a new symbol um, to the proxy that if you call dollar sign track, it calls track self. And what this means is we now have this special property that, and some people ask for this too, and I think it's kind of powerful, is that if you track it, 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 it changes whenever any properties on it shall change. So essentially it triggers um, basically, if you track it, if you change first name, it triggers this. Or if you change last name, it triggers this. And essentially, what I what I what I did here was for normal iteration, I don't have to worry about it because the people will either hit the keys specifically, they'll call length. So if someone for loops over over um, just like a normal for loop they're going to, sure, they hit the specific keys and you'll be like, well, what if they add one? They're not gonna know if there's a new one, but they listen to length. So if length changes, then it will trigger. Basically all the normal iteration without my optimization will work for in, um, the thing I had to handle was objects. So object.keys has a special track self. And the other thing I had to do was in arrays, helpers, which purposely untrack, I just had the, add this one extra access here that goes, oh, just check if the array has a track property. If it does, then we're gonna track it. That, that, and it's a small thing and it means that anyone else who does these kind of optimal like untracked arrays, which basically people who write for control loops, which we have for an index. And I think there's a key in solid primitives. They just gotta do this. And I think there's lots of other applications perhaps for this kind of track um, symbol, but between these two now, um, essentially our, our example here in the playground 
if I took this example now and copied it to an environment where we have the latest solid, this works. It only console logs once. We're smart enough to know that this is only listening to this key and we didn't touch that key. However, if we do a for loop, as you saw in my previous example, um, it still works. So we're able to identify when you're doing iteration tracking versus non-iteration tracking and keep perfectly fine grained updates when you're not tracking iteration. So this is the hidden part, which is really cool. I, I don't know how to advertise it. So yes, we get top level arrays um, in solid, but even, you know, it, it actually comes out of our ability to do even finer grain tracking um, and be able to identify the difference between iterating over reactive state or stores rather um, um, compared to just accessing it. No, but splice will tr I, I actually splice might trigger length, but even if it doesn't trigger length, you're you're hitting the the index. As long as the index changes, um, you're 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 still fine. Like we like obviously in my four helper, I'm purposely triggering the 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 track, so the, the, it's going to work. But in a normal situation where you're not doing that, you, you splice is changing the the index, right? So, so, so technically speaking, splice isn't, isn't going to be a problem. Um, so yeah, the, I, this is, this is, this is cool. As I said, this is an improvement in a sense. People are like, why didn't you do this already? But what's really cool about solids um, proxy approach is it doesn't have specialized types for, I mean, someone asked if we support weak maps and all that stuff. No, we don't. Honestly, the problem with those are they're mutable. Um, they're, they're basically mutable APIs and I wasn't like our APIs are uh, read write segregated. So like if someone puts a set in a store, like now something like set store needs to know like like what does it mean to set? Like if you hit to a, if you got to a store if you got to a map and you try like what what, what do you call it? Do you call add? Does putting an index on it do something? Do you set a key? Like it would need special logic the way we're doing it. It doesn't make sense for those to go inside our. Um, our immutable version. The mutable version is an interesting question, but essentially, um, yeah, I mean, maybe Solid should have al always done this from the, the get-go, but um, I think this is a, a, a really nice kind of addition. And I, I mean, to prove my point again, let's just get rid of this um, now, because it works top level and we should, oh, we should be able to, do this if I change this to do's. Um, did I miss one? You know, it's the same day. It, it works top level too. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe obviously we should have always done it, but this is still like just a really nice improvement. Um, okay, so there's there there is so, I, I'm often really critical uh, on the mut mutable side, but um, I am throwing mutable a bit of a bone, so to speak, in the next release. Um, there's actually more store work going on here. And um, it's related to the issue I pulled up on GitHub earlier. I, although, um, let's see here, we talked about, we talked about deferred streaming, talked about top level arrays, talked about stale resource reads. Um, yeah, so I've got a couple things up. Let's let's talk create mutable for a second. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Mutables need batching. Okay, this is an oversight on my point part because I never used create mutable, um, like ever ever. I, I don't see a reason for it for the most part. I created it so that like, do you know do you know what I use create mutable for? Have you ever seen the X state solid integration? Sometimes there are APIs out there which don't let you get in there. They're just like, we handle stuff ourselves. And I'm like, um, I want to make you reactive. So I'll sneak create mutable in there and be like, 
what if I proxy your internal state and then you don't even know you're dealing with a proxy and now I've, I can intercept it. And that's why I did it. I, I basically, my first X state solid example was basically hijacking their internal state by wrapping it in create mutable and X state has no idea it's dealing with immutable and solids like basically able to listen to it and then reconcile the changes or whatever. And essentially, ta-da, we have fine grained um, uh, state machines, something you haven't really seen ever anywhere, um, at least in JavaScript. But um, I mean, okay, I don't know that for certain, but if you look at all the other X state stuff, even the stuff with reactive libraries like Svelte and Vue, they don't do that. Um, either the Vue could because create mutable is like they're uh, reactive, but we have reconcile, which is kind of our super power here. Um, but what it meant was this, this, some weird stuff started happening because solid doesn't batch by default. So like you'd like pop and uh, like, what the hell is going on? The list is getting bigger. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, I mean, is this one actually doing push nodes? Sorry, this is push. Someone actually changed this example. Okay, my bad. But um, essentially, we're having this problem. I, I'm, I want to. I want One of the ones that actually is this pop. Yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, essentially, the, the 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 problem was that. Solid doesn't batch. And when you're doing mutable, you're doing a bunch of, like our set state function batches. So like if you do a bunch of changes in it, it all kind of works together. But with create mutable, you're doing like line by line by line by line by line. You can get in a weird state where you're like halfway done moving something or, and it would trigger the array. And then like it would see the wrong thing and it would it try and like insert a, the same DOM node in two locations or something. It's like weird stuff like that. Like it's keyed and then like, it, Essentially, just terrible stuff would happen, and we, we, I was kind of pressed with this problem. I'm like, okay, I have to fix this. But the problem is, I don't want to have like special array types because the the, the solution to the problem is when you have um, push or pop or these array methods. You know, if you had a weak set or something, like if you if you have some sort of mutable array methods, the proxy doesn't know what to do with it. Do, do I want to make custom wrappers for everything and bloat the library size? Do I want to deal with all this stuff? No, I, I, I like proxies because they're simple and I didn't want to deal with any of this stuff. Luckily, we, we actually figured out a really smart solution to this problem, um, which is kind of cool. Um, if, you, if you just, I hope you understand the problem. The problem is like, you can literally like be mid doing something. You can like pop something off. It, it was erroring is essentially the thing. I don't think we see the error here. Yeah, here's the error. Yeah, here's the error. The reason it's not working is it's telling you you can't find reading name of undefined. So what's happening is you it pops it, when it, when you when you run the pop operation against a proxy. What it, yeah, let, let, this this serves more um, more explanation. I'm sorry. If you create a proxy, you ever created a proxy before? You have const p equals new proxy. Let's proxy an array. And let's intercept gets and we get target and whatever the property is. Okay. So we're not going to do anything special here. We're just going to return target property as if we were never here. You're supposed to use the reflection API, but you know, whatever. This works too. And but what we're going to do is we're going to console log what property we hit. Okay. So here we go. We got a proxy. Okay. Now when you go p dot pop. You get two console logs. You get the pop event and you get the length. Okay. And actually, I think to be more explicit, I'll show you what that well, because the read isn't that important. The the set is more important. So what's cool about proxies is even though you're calling pop, it intercepts everything. So um, so I think it's so return true to say that I handle it and then Console log set property, is that right? Yeah. Get. Pop is not the best example. Um, 
What's another operation? We got to put some numbers in the array too. Let's see, is this better? Pop isn't bad because pop just reduces a list, but let's try something like on, let's try something like shift. Here you go. Shift is a good one. <laughs> Look what, th this is part of why I tell people that using mutable proxies is proxies have, take you take a hit when you access them. And if if you sometimes people people kind of talk about about like oh you you're you always cloning arrays that sucks right you know when you're using the immutable stuff but look what happens when we we shift how many times do we hit the proxy now times this by like ten thousand you know like in a benchmark uh, it's it's faster to not mutate um, anyway. Uh, get shift so it needs to get it off the proxy first of all then get the length then get zero and get one and then set zero presumably with the value from one get two set one with the value from two you know it, it just shifts them all up you can see get set get set get set get, get set and then finally set the length at the end to shorten the, the, the array the problem was without batching this in solid what happens is you you get here and then you set is actually these will all work fine there might be some duplicates so maybe that's a problem when you get to the end you set two here so you 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 basically move four into three yeah maybe this isn't the what i'm missing oh do you know what i'm missing <sighs> sorry guys i keep on I, I keep on missing the uh the 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 important part Lead property. <sighs> Sorry. This is what happens when you do things like impromptu. You kind of like miss really obvious things. Delete target property. And true. Okay. Something like that. Okay. Here's 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 this is what I was missing. Pop was actually fine too, probably. If I do pop, you'll see it too. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, if I'm pop shorter. It calls delete before it sets the length, which is is nothing, it's not that important, you'd think, except it means that you put a hole in the array. So when you don't batch this update, solid sees the delete and go and, and sees an array that looks like, in this case, one, two three undefined, right? And then it iterates it with the for loop and then it hits undefined and it go and it tries to like read some property of undefined here. Uh, that wasn't this example, was it? Where, where did I have it? Um, this one, yeah. See, cannot read property undefined reading name. So essentially it gets here, does the for loop tries to read cat.name, but it's undefined because we ran it immediately. Uh, sorry, which one is it? Yeah, it's because we ran it here on the first mutation instead of waiting for all the mutations to happen. Right? And I mean, there's an easy solution to this problem I'm not saying it's a good solution, but there is an easy solution to this problem, right? Yeah, batch everything. No, that's not that's not the solution. But ba batch this, right? We can just go. What if we just batch this? As I said, you never hit this when using the set state API or using produce because they're wrapped in set state and set state batches. If I do it now, oh, after I fix this. Um, pop works because it, it waits till the applied changes. So, anyways, I didn't want to intercept everything. I was like, oh man, this is going to be a pain in the pain to solve. But the solution actually ended up being really, really, really quite simple here. Um, luckily, um, once we figured it out, <laughs> if we figure, if we, I mean, this I only hacked it for arrays because this is all we have. But essentially, if if the value is a function that's on the array prototype. Instead of returning that function, proxy it. 
we already have a proxy. So just replace that function with a, with a batch version of that and apply your arguments again against the, um, against the proxy itself. If, you, if anyone knows the third argument to a proxy is called the receiver is the proxy object. You get the underlying target, you get the property, you get the proxy itself. So you, you, you're able to basically apply it, the batch against the proxy again. So essentially with um, solid um, you know, 1.4, we can take this example, remove the batch again, you never hit this problem in view probably because they batch everything all the time. Um, but again, performance, right? Um, and if we just drop this one in here, pop works without batching because we inject batches automatically now on um, these array methods. And I didn't need to make a observable array. Like if you look into the source code, sometimes it's like view or MobX, they have like special array types. We have no special array types. Um, this one-liner basically saved us from a bunch of pain. And it's why proxies are so cool. And now you don't have to uh, worry. Um, all the native array methods will automatically um, um, have this behavior um, and batch automatically for you. And there was one additional example in here that um, was a good point. Uh, push. Recon, recon, reconcile, which usually people use with set state, but you know you can use manually with this unwrap kind of thing. And um, essentially, it it was reconcile is doing a whole bunch of extra work here because it's it's triggering the partial states. What reconcile does is it takes an immutable kind of structural clone change and reduce it into fine grained updates. It's basically a differ for your data. And this, this is really terrible. Whereas if you just change this call with a batch, suddenly, and this only happens with create mutable, all our other APIs don't have this problem. So I never, I never you know, saw it. If you put in batch and do the same thing, now it stops. It does mount the original five initially, but then when you when you do the reconcile to remove the one item, it only removes the one item. Whereas before, when we didn't batch here, um, just gonna, essentially it was doing a bunch of moves. It would like, yeah, mount the original items, but then after it removed three, it would recreate four and five. So th this though isn't solved by my little proxy trick. And I, I don't want to, I, I was like, well, I can batch reconcile, but instead I, I came up with actually a really simple solution. I created, came up with a new API for this, um, for mutables called modify mutable. And it's kind of like a set state kind of thing, but it gives um, mutables now a really easy way to, uh, to use modifiers the same way set state does. So in this case, you could just pass the mutable in and um, pass the, uh, the reconcile in and then it'll just work and it'll be batched. I mean, it's a small helper function, but it just makes our lives easier. And I, sorry, I forgot to mention this. Since create mutable is actually based on all the same um, internal state and all the, the fun stuff we've been doing here um, with the stores, um, you know, all the, all the stuff. Essentially, um, simple to do's. Create Mutable now also supports top level arrays. Um, I mean, I, I kept local storage in here, but this one's using Create Mutable. But again, it, it, you know, essentially to do is dot push. You can actually see the batching in process in here. So this this actually has both the batching and the top level arrays working with Create Mutable, if that's your style, so to speak. Um, well, that's weird. Why are there these? Oh, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, so essentially, if I just do this, we can push and everything works. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, in my opinion, that's that's the, the main reason for, for this. I mean, I, I'm showing an example here uh, where, like, you can do this kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, I don't ever, I almost never recommend um, Create Mutable. Um, 
almost never. I think there's some tree structures, but most people who went that way ended up using produce anyways. So yeah, I, I, I think mutable proxies are super, super dangerous. Um, like the, they're about the biggest foot gun I could give someone. Um, and the thing is like Vue gets away with it because they have a VDOM. Like the worst thing you can do is trigger the, a re-render. And as we all know from React, re-rendering over and over again isn't really that bad. Right. Um, so like in our case, if you, if you, if you did that butterfly effect, like earlier, you could be recreating the actual DOM, right? This is, this is the trade-off. Um, there's less kids gloves with solid, right? That's how you get the performance. Um, so I, I do my best to try and encourage people away from awkward patterns. Um, but you can do it, you know, and there are places, as I said, integrations are a big, big part of it. Um, I'm, I actually have more features, not that many more to dig into on the code side, um, but I, I actually have just a couple more notable mentions, I think is the best way to, to call it. So yeah, we talked about deferred streaming. We talked about top-level arrays and stores and like what that implication is. We talked about stale resource reads, but we haven't talked about this one, combining multiple custom renders. This one is kind of a little bit out of left field about what we've been talking about, but, um, and you've seen this demoed on the stream before uh, by Nikhil and he, he, his, he, he made solid three essentially, but he was sitting there and he's like, this really sucks. I made solid three, but I want to have DOM transformations in here. And sure, I can make a custom DOM render. If you guys saw that stream, um, it's pretty cool. I benchmarked it in the JS framework benchmark and the custom DOM renderer that was like just a, I think we made it in code sandbox. You know, maybe we can actually find it here. What was it? Uh, custom DOM renderer. This, this custom DOM renderer we made in solid um, on stream. That was, where is it here? All of, 62 lines of code. Um, I ran it in the JS framework benchmark and it actually uh, came out almost the same performance as Inferno. Like I had to lit, I had to svelte, I had to view um, just for this like, this really simple implementation. But he, 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 he was like, that's not good enough. <laughs> He's like, I want solids like vanilla JS level performance and I want my 3JS too. So, you know, and I'm like for, for some custom renders, it doesn't matter. If you're in the terminal, you don't need the DOM or whatever. If you're solid native, you probably don't need the DOM either, right? But he he was like, no, I I want the best of the best. So he figured out a way that you can have multiple compilers working on the same code. You can actually have like template and have like th three JS like native elements and DOM native elements next to each other in the template and they'll get broken up the same way components get broken apart from the static like DOM nodes and they'll be compiled they can be compiled with separate compilers within the same file and essentially st stitched together so with this little example he took his universal solid 3 render took the ultra efficient solid web um render stuck them together and he he's got the both the best renders working together um and now his little fork hack that he did himself is now an official part of our um, Babel plugin. So now anyone who makes a custom render can actually mix and match custom renders within the same project, within the same template. Um, so this, this again, might seem a little edge case to some people, but it is super, super powerful um, way of uh, being able to um, kind of like as I said, make the, you know, maybe you have a canvas renderer and, and still be able to leverage solids um, DOM renderer. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, let's see if I talked about everything else. Uh, class name HTML4 deprecated. Uh, experimental refetch resources has been removed. Um, this was something that we introduced in 1.3. Um, it was a bust. We're still looking at other patterns here, but refetching all the resources just doesn't work. Um, talked about synchronous top level create effect, bunch of TypeScript improvements. We've, our current component type was like, had a, this optional children, like it was a good default, but it was hard to extend. So now our component type makes no assumptions about children and we're going to have new, um, 
parent component, which is one that could have children or flow component, which means that it must have children and, um, and also a void component, which means no, no children. So we've, we've improved the types around components now, um, which, you know, helps a lot um, being able to indicate whether children are necessary, optional, or not at all. Um, some other small changes that I mentioned, create resources, sources are now memos. So when you trigger them on refetch, they don't rerun the source again. Um, we talked about create mutable. So yeah, that's, that's, that's most of the list here. There's actually one more feature that I'm working on right now that I hope to get in the release. And it's, um, I, I'm not hundred percent happy with the solution, which is why I didn't showcase it off tonight. Um, but um, there is, and you guys might view this more as a bug or, or something, but um, I have a solution for it and I'm going to get to it, but you, you may have seen, you may have seen this uh, behavior before. Um, essentially, if you, if you create, I guess it doesn't really matter. Signal. And let's go const create signal. And I'm, I guess it doesn't really matter what I put in the signal. And let's go count, set count, doesn't really matter. Now, if down here somewhere, actually I should have kept the set timeout. I don't know why I'm getting rid of it. I don't need it necessarily in these cases, but it just, it, it helps separate stuff a little bit. If I go in here and I go console.log count, and we're gonna go read count in this in the here. And then I go set count plus or count plus one and console log it again. Did I like miss importing something again? I guess I can check in the. This is the one fun thing that happens sometimes when you're in the playground. There it is. What, like what, what's with that delay? Okay. Yeah, I broke something anyways. So sorry, count zero, count, count one, unsurprisingly, right? You, you updated the count. Now, if we use batch from SolidJS, it has this behavior of applying all the changes, but it does more than just apply all the changes. It ensures that you have consistency within the timing of the batch. So if someone reads like a memo or something, it's going to be in the past because you haven't updated it, which means that the count also has to be in the past. So this is basically opt in to react um, like behavior. Um, I don't know what's going on. The, the playground is like, There we go. Okay. It's like I have to open the debugger or something. Something's up. Okay. So this is so weird. We, we saw it a second ago. I just wanted to refresh to showcase it off. And now it's like not doing it. Okay, that's fun. Oh, it's it's because I have 10 seconds. <laughs> I'm like blaming the playground. Thank you, Brendan. Everyone's like, yeah, 10 seconds is a long time. Thank you, dumb me. Yes, 10 seconds is a long time. Okay, see, th this is opt into React mode, let's call it, right? There's a reason. Consistency is important. Some people criticize React about this, but this is, this is legitimate. Um, there's a reason for this, okay? But so this is how batching works, and then it applies all the changes at the end. Now, the, the you know, as I said, there's reasons for it. However, again, um, let's let's just change this to something else. For various reasons, the nesting and whatnot, um, I suddenly change this to store dot. Count. Or 
account and then change this to um, set, set store count. One, you do see the update, even though you're in a batch. So this is kind of bad and kind of terrible. And I've known about this forever. And unfortunately, this is actually tricky to solve because of the nested nature of stores. But I actually have a solution that works. I'm just not sure I'm happy with it because it adds 200 bytes of code to the store implementation and it requires me to expose something internal from uh, from signals. Um, so I'm, I'm working through the details of it, but in the next version of Solid, this will be fixed and this will ensure consistency, not just with batching, but with transitions and stuff. Stores kind of leak. Leaking consistency usually doesn't have that detrimental of effects, um, but um, we're fixing it finally. So stores, you know, they, they are the most complicated reactive primitive to have. We'll now have proper um, async and uh, synchronous consistency through batching. If you asked felt this is how it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't. Yeah, so, yeah, and even, yeah, even a bit of, there's a bit of a view take too. I mean, if you've seen that old tweet, uh, like the, the reason batching is important um, and I, I can kind of show this um, with, let me get rid of the stores because the store is clearly garbage now. So let's, let's just go backwards so we can see myself work. The reason, that, the reason batching is important is because if you, let's go const old count. Count times two, right? We've all seen this before. Uh, let's call it now. <laughs> um, the problem is. The problem is this, I'm gonna get rid of our batch for a second. And as people know, solid, um, and if we go console log count, times two equals double count, okay. All right, there we go. And we'll make this console log again. Unsurprisingly, because solids like always update immediate kind of thing out in the wild, we get consistent. Zero times two is zero, one times two is two. Right, and actually let's start from one, so, okay. Thank you, playground, okay. One times two is two, two times two is four, unsurprisingly. Now, Think about it. This, this is telling me one times two is two and one times two is two. And even though we set it up to two here, once we get out of the batch, you know, once we get here and we're like done, you'll see the update. But the reason we, keep it inside it's because when you're batching so double count can't update while we're batching because we haven't notified it and if we let count increment without notifying double count we essentially create a, a glitch you would see count two times two equals two And essentially, like, 
yeah, I mean, there's different opinions on 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 how this should go, but like the the, the old thing is, um, in in React, it works like like what I just showed you. Like you 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 see the past all the time. In Solid, you tend to by default see the future, right? You you see you see you you or the, like you see it right away. If you open up Svelte and do this kind of I don't actually I don't know if I want to do this right now. It's fine. If you open up Svelte, you'll see you'll see you'll see two times two equals two. It, and that's why we say it's not glitch free. And if you open view, you'll see the future too, but I, uh, but they don't apply effects yet. So if you added like a, a Dom ref on the end here, um, you would see like two times two equals four, but the Dom still thinks it's two. So like, there's a whole bunch of different opinions here, but um, essentially, I, don't, I didn't need to get into this probably right now. Um, batching, like if you want consistency, either update everything right away or keep everything into the, in the past until you can notify. If you split it, it's called uh, it's called glitched. Um, and um, Solid and React are both glitch free because of this, this thing. And that's why the, the batching is is important. And right now, solid stores break my contract, so they are not good. Um, but we will be fixing this in 1.4. So again, this is a small thing that you probably haven't noticed or kind of slip in the cracks. Maybe you don't use batch very often. Um, but now in 1.4, we're going to ensure we're glitch free um, across the board, even with stores. So that's that's the last feature I think that's going in 1.4. A lot of really cool stuff here. I hope um, you all enjoyed. Um, looking into that and understanding that um yeah what we, we did three hours on this stuff it's amazing um i am not going to be around next week so there's no stream next week i hopefully will have a stream the following week but i'm actually traveling on fridays two fridays in a row i'll be back in town but i'm not 100 percent sure i'll do that so the, we might have a little um silent radio silence so to speak on the stream stuff at least um but uh when i come back um hopefully we'll be in a good place to pick up and uh start looking at some of the progress we've been uh, basically let's look at solid start and see what's going on with that um anyway uh yeah uh I wish everyone to have a great weekend. Um, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. And uh, I will s see you all probably in, a, I guess, two weeks or, or so. So uh, until next time, thank you. See ya.